Welcome back. So what I'd like to do right now, I'm gonna recall what we have done so far. So I'll give you like a quick overview what we have done last lecture, then after that continue talking about the storage model in more details. Okay? So what we have done so far. At the high level, we design goal of the database management system is to support the database that exceed the amount of memory available. That's what I'm talking about, the disk-oriented database management system. So everything can be stored on the disk. Yeah. But what we're planning to do here, we are not going to tell anyone work with the database that what we're looking for, that means wait a second, I need to bring whatever you want from the desk and bring it to you. So the goal planning to do here, give an illusion to the application of the user that use our database, that we have enough memory that is going to store your entire database in the memory. Sometimes when the user of the program application at the top asks, said, for example, I need page number two, and the page two is going to be available in the main memory. If it's not, so we try to find a way in order to speed up the access to the desk to bring this data and make it available to the user as soon as possible. So since reading and writing operation to the desk is expensive, it must be managed carefully. That's the meaning here. Okay. So we don't want to have a larger star in order to perform this operation. We have bad, to say, management to the puffer board, which handle the data from whenever we fetch data from the disk and be available in the main memory. Okay. So in other words, again, we don't want to have a larger star from the fetching something from the desk to slow down everything else. So we want the database, or our database management system that we have to be able to other, process while try to fetch this way the required page that was not available in the main memory. So there's many tricks, many stuff, many data structures, many mechanisms we start learning today what the database management system try to do to achieve in order to give or provide this kind of illusion to the user. Whatever you want, the page is available. It's available in the main memory. Even if the page is not available in the main memory, we try to do our best in order to speed up the access, the data fetch, or come up with a better environment of the same buffer pool, which allow us in order to keep the data that required by the user in the main memory. Okay? So just to remind you what the disk oriented in general, okay? Which is the thing that we are going to do in your coding assignment. Okay? So on the top, this is a disk-oriented database management system. We learned last time the database is going to be stored in the file, or the file as a sequence of pages. And it's going to be stored in the main memory here, in the desk, sorry. This is a desk here. So at the disk, we do have like a page directory, which allow us in order, so I'm going to write directory, which allow us in order to figure out where the page is going to be stored in the desk. Okay, so we have a page one, page two, for example, many pages here. That's the database file here in the desk. That's what we plan to do in your coding assignment one. By the way, we have a good news. The department finally assigns an, a TA to the class. So either today or tomorrow, it depends on the TA when we're going to apply, so expect that we're going to receive an email from the TA. The TA is going to, he or she, I don't know him or her yet. I didn't meet him yet. I'm waiting or her. So it's going to send email to you, and it's going to be responsible for the coding assignment. So if you have any questions, any problem with the coding assignment, reach him or her as soon as possible. Okay? So anyway, so this is going to be relying, uh, stored in the disk as a page, from page 1, 2, 3, etc. Then, and the main way you try, anyone in the higher level ask, I need the page, for example, number 5. So the system is going to do what? We do have in the top, in the desk, or memory, the memory, we do have what is called the buffer pool. With the buffer pool here, and any page you're not looking for is not the page first must check it be available in the main memory. If it's not available, wasn't available, so in this case, we need to do what? We need to have find a way in order to perform an expensive input out operation in order to fetch this page, put in the buffer pool, then after that, or turn the address to the base of the whatever the program or the, say, the uh, execution engine that asks for this page. Okay, so we did this part. We take, we talked about last time we said the file, uh, how can uh, we start looking at actually the problem one, how the database management system is gonna rep uh, represent, I mean, the database in files on disk, or in other words, how it's gonna lay out the data on the desk. So we start, uh, we said uh, last time, the each, uh, we do have the file, and the file can be divided into fixed size blocks of data called pages. Then where I show you like different types of different mechanisms, how can we organize the data on the disk? Because remember, 
it's not enough if you say, okay, it looks like my file has from page one up to the file. So I'm going to store them in the disk. Then you need to find out a way or show me a way or provide me the way in order to access this data, in order to fetch the data as needed. It's like in a way in order to fetch data, okay? Actually, we do have a different ways how to organize the page in the file or the page storage architecture. We said that we can use heap file organization, which is the one that we covered last time. There is a sequential or sort of sort of file organization, different ways to keep the data sort sequence. I mean the blocks next to each other, and we do have another way. It's called hashing file organization, and we do have using the tree structure. We are not going to go over all of them. Just we give you an example how can you use the heap file organization. What do you mean the heap file? That's the way to organize the data on the desk here. So the heap file, as we mentioned last time, is an ordered collection of pages with the tuple that are stored in a random order. So in this case, the way that organizes your data is going to be an order page. So every time when you try to store the, your data or you have a new tuple or create a new block, so the, what you plan to do, find the first block that has a space in order to store a new tuple. Or you can create any block anywhere and keep tracking this one somehow. You're going to see how can you keep tracking these two blocks. So it's going to be a random assigned. The data is going to be, or tuple is going to be uh, stored in the random order. There is no, you say, uh, order in this case. Okay? The first block that contains the space, just to store this tuple there. Of course, we need to have an extra metadata or extra data, which allow us in order to keep tracking what page exists and also which one has, or have, you say, free space. Remember, what you're planning to do here. I need to figure out whether my pages exist or not. How can you tell? If I don't have a structure here, so we end up with scanning the entire disk in order to tell whether the pages exist or not, which is not good practice. So somehow we need to have extra piece of information in order to tell me whether the page exists or not, which one's going to have free space, so I can jump directly to that page in order to fetch it, to store the file inside this one, then after that I need to reflect the change to the desk. Make sense to you? Okay. So we do two different ways in order to represent the heap file in general. The first one, linked list, with no one do that. That's bad choice. And the second way, as I showed you last time, we have a, have a page directory. So this means it looks like we have an extra page at the beginning of the file. We call this one the page directory. This page directory is going to allow me to do the following. What? It's going to maintain like uh, uh, keep information, metadata about to say uh, which page exists or not, uh, the number of free slots get per page, and etc. So I have a many information about where can I find data, which is the block that contains a free space. So in this case, this page directory must be fetched to the main memory, it must be resides in the main memory in order to tell me how can we reach find these pages. This very board must be available in the main memory. This is one important thing. It looks like later when you talk about the index, the first thing I will say the root where we hop we if we manage to keep this root in the main memory. Because every time I try to use index, I'm gonna need to access this root. So the root is gonna tell me whether I go to the left side or right side, sub G and etc. The same thing. The page director must be resides in the main memory in order to tell me, in order to help me, in order to decide whether the page exists or not. For example, assume I said I need the page 100. So in this case, I need to check the page directory. Will the page 100 exist? Yes. So if it exists, so it's easy for you to figure out how to fetch later. If it's not, that means don't waste your time. Yeah? Of course, at the beginning, you need to check whether the page 100 is exist in the main memory or not. If not, you need to check to find out where, how could you fetch from the desk. So that means we have to get access to the page directory, to the file, which is going to contain all the information needed to allow me to navigate my way in order to track which page exists or not, and which one has free space, and etc. Then after that, we look at how can we how the page looks like from the side. So since we have a sequence of page, there's the file, and we do have a page directory in order to navigate my way, help me in order to find out the page within this file. Then after that, we talk about the page layout. So in this case, I need to look, see what does look like inside the page itself, so from inside here. So that's what we did last time. We said the page maybe looks like uh, something like this. In a second, let me just clear this one. So in this case, we do have like, this is a page. All of them will be fixed length. At the beginning, we do have a header, all right? And we do have like a slot array, okay? Then after that, here, it's gonna be like a tuple one, 
tool two, whatever, add it to them. Okay. So in the header, we do have like keep talking of the following here. The header is gonna tell me exactly, for example, uh, the number of user slots. How many user slots do we have here? For example, two or, th or three. So all this information can be in the header of each page. Okay. In addition to that, it's going to have like the offset of the starting location of the last user slot. So you know what the offset of the starting location of the last user slot. So when you try to insert something new trouble in this case, you know that you're gonna insert this one after that the last user slot. Okay. In the slot area, it looks like like a special array that keeps or keep track of the location of the start of each tuple. So in this case, you have the first slot. For example, it's gonna be keep track. Of, this is the beginning of the tuple one. This is the beginning of the tuple two. If you have another tuple, for example, you're gonna say this is the beginning, for example, of the tuple three. Add it. And the way it goes is gonna be from the beginning to the end, and the tuple is gonna be from the end to the beginning. Yeah. This is the way how they're going to be uh, insert the data are going to be uh, increased. Okay. So after that, we talk about the way how can we store the tuple inside the page. Okay, and that's why we said that last time we do have like in each tuple inside this one how it looks like. We didn't say how we actually insert or store the data inside this tuple, but how this format of the tuple looks like. So the format of the tuple is going to have something like this. We do have a header. And here we're going to store the information in this tuple. Okay, so the header or tuple header is going to contain metadata about the tuple. So give me many details, okay, whose key and X is this one. Okay, and it might have what is called the mit bitmap for the null values. For example, if you have some value attribute stored as a null value, we do have like an extra piece of information tell me, for example, the first index, and the, for example, from... Uh, let's say index 0 and let's say start with index 15, 50, etc. All of them are null values. That means when you ask fetch this tuple, there's no need in order to navigate your way within the tuple if these values are null. Okay? Uh, we don't need to have like a metadata about the data or the schema of the database can be stored inside this tuple. So it might be stored in the inside the uh, page or maybe in separate page. It depends on the database system. Okay, we do have like we talk about last time. We have the page ID and the tuple ID. Okay, what do you mean the page ID? The page ID. This is a unique identifier which can help us in order to locate the block of data or page in the system or on the desk. So the page ID, with ID is equal to what? It's gonna equal to the file ID, file path plus the offset inside the file. So using the page ID, we can show you that where the page is going to be stored. Of course, I need to know where which part of our file belongs to this page and the offset within this file in order to access this page. And remember, the file is going to be stored as a sequence of the block, okay, on the desk. Good. So we do have a tuple ID that we talked about last time. Or maybe you're going to say a record. ID, both of them are the same meaning. I'm going to talk about the main difference between the tuple and the record, but in this class, we don't distinguish between them, okay? The tuple ID is going to identify, for example, or locate the tuple inside somewhere. So it's going to tell me where this tuple is going to look for. I'm looking for a specific tuple. And starting next lecture, I mean uh, uh, Thursday, hopefully, yeah, we start looking at the creating an index. One way in order to need to point to the tuple that contains the data based on the index, we're going to use the tuple ID here. So the tuple ID is going to contain the following information, or the record ID. It's going to have like the page ID, then plus the offset inside this page. And you know here, we need to find, in order to figure out which where tuples exist here, for example, to tuple one. So in this case, I'm going to give you the page ID for this page, and also you're going to use the slot, or this is the offset in this, within the page. Whether you're going to slot one, or slot two, or slot three. So basically, this information, we can navigate our way, we can fetch this data. So far, so good, hopefully. We covered this one last time, okay? Then after that, we looked at the database storage bar two, so we still try to finish the problem one. How the database management system, I mean, represents, I mean, the data on files on desk. In other words, how can we lay out the data on the desk? I know what we did, we have a block, so, I mean, the file is gonna be sequence of a block. By the way, when I say the file, you can imagine that it's gonna be a relation, student relation, or let's say, instructor relation, and etc. okay? That contains a number of tuples, 
and you have a set of uh, let's say records. So we have a data store there. So that's what we call a file. Okay. So anyway, um, I uh, in the second part of the last week lecture, we talk as a mission. We cover the uh, database of storage. Let's take a look. How can we actually store the data within the tuple? So for example, what we're gonna have here. I'm gonna give you like a schema, okay, of this specific relational tuple. Assume that the relation that we're gonna store with contains the ID and the name and the GBA, for example. You wanna store the tuple inside uh, this information. So in this case, I'm gonna take out the actual implement or the actual, let's say, uh, bytes that I need in, in order to store the ID. And it depends what the size of ID, depends on the data type that you specify in the schema. Whether there be two bytes, six bytes, 100 bytes, it depends on you, it depends on the data type and the name too, and the GPA, whether you're going to use a double or use a number. So we have a different representation of each of them. Okay. Generally speaking, the tuple is going to like, uh, is essentially a sequence of bytes or bytes arrays. That's what we're looking for in this level. Okay. So again, in data representation, this part we try to find out to see how can we represent the data for individual individual attributes or let's say column in the tuples. It's worth mentioning here, as I mentioned here, we do have like a record and tuples. Generally speaking, we take a look at different database parts, the text work. You're gonna say the tuple is gonna be like a collection of attribute values for such a schema. It give you like a specific schema and gonna be like a collection of attribute value for the given schema we call this one a tuple. For example, in this case, ID and name and GBA. So the tuple is gonna be the ID, for example, 100 and the name might be Alice and the GBA is gonna, for example, 3.33. Okay, this one, tuple here. A record is the seek when you convert this one into bytes, we call this one some text box, we call this one, in this case, well, I'm not gonna say tuple. The tuple either convert at the sequence of byte containing data for one tuple, we call this one a record. So in this case, we're gonna convert this one, let's say, uh, 10 bytes. And this one required 20 bytes for the Alice. And here maybe, for example, 10, uh, let's say five or six bytes in order to store this information. So then we call this one a record, okay? But as I mentioned in this class, we don't distinguish between them, so I'm gonna choose this one. When we say tuple, it depends on the context, whether I mean the actual data or I mean the, let's say, the uh, sequence of bytes in this case. The interesting thing, which we're gonna now take a look um, more details and hopefully be convinced, why the database management system do the job? Why do not rely on the database? Why don't rely on the operating system and gonna take care of this one? Because starting now, we're gonna see the database management system knows better. Because who created this tuple, the database? Who's gonna create the binary or convert or represent this one into the say, uh, uh, represent, I mean, the data for the individual attributes for each of them uh, in the say, in, in binary format or let's say in the byte format, the database. So the database can, management system can tell exactly what's going on. For the data or for the operating system, they saw these tuple as a sequence of bytes. But I don't know what's going on with this one because I don't find I have a way that helped me in order to interpret or in order to understand what's going on. The only one can know that or can interrupt this, interrupt this data, the one that created this one, which is database management system, based on, of course, in the schema and the system. Okay. We take a look, by the way, we have a uh, many ways how the database represents the data. So it depends on the data types. If you remember, we talk about the integer, big in, uh, integer, or big, sorry, big integer, small integer, or the tiny integer. We are going to, for the most database management system, the way that uh, they going to represent this kind of data, we call this one the fixed length, has a fixed value, okay? It's usually the same way that we would represent this. Uh, value like in the C or C++ language. So we're going to rely on actually mainly we're going to use the IEEE 754 standard which help us in order to inform how can you represent the data which is used in the C or C++ language. So in this case, angel and big angel, the only thing we're going to do here, you're going to create or say, uh, if you have the I, uh, ID as angel, for example, so in this case you just define in the C language or whatever, you're going to say uh, ID is going to be the integer value. And done. So the system is going to represent this one entirely. So we don't have any problem in this case. The variable uh, procession numbers, 
what is the number of gas looks like, uh, like a float, a real, or double, which is going to be, which going to contains what is called the rounding error, the one that we covered last time. And you know that when the, uh, we study, or today when they teach you the programming language, we try to perform the computation, store the database and float, or let's say uh, the variable position number, they said be careful because we cannot uh, completely get, guarantee the accuracy of the operations here. So if you try to store the data that's stored monetary data, or the data has high accuracy, or has a, in this case, we need to, uh, we are not going to store these data as uh, float or real or double, but we are going to store these data as a fixed uh, point position numbers. Okay, which in this case, we're going to use a numeric or decimal here. But we notice this one. If you use a numeric or decimal, this means you are not going to use the I triple E, let's say, 756 standard. You're going to use a different way in order to store this data. So every time you try to perform the computation from addition, multiplication, for any variable from the data type numeric or decimal, either is fine, both of them the same meaning, okay? So in this case, you need to do an extra work, as I showed you last time, you need to, in order to interrupt, in order to understand, in order to perform some operation, in order to just extract the actual actual value. Then after that, when you do operation additional multiplication, that you have to do this one, and you have to store the, uh, the data in a special way. So generally speaking, we're going to store the data as a bar chart or as a string, but not exactly a string. As I showed you last time, there's a special structure. So we're going to add more details. We're going to have like the precession, and we need to add the scale. By the way, we say the precession on the scale. The precession is, generally speaking, is the number of digits in the number, and the scale is the number of digits to the right of the decimal point in number. For example, if we said the number 1, 2, 3, point four, five, so here in this case, the precession is going to be 5 because we have 5 number. This is a precession here. And the scale is going to be 2. And this is the scale equal to. So this information is to add this one in order to help you in order to how can you store this information. So anyway, um, I think, yeah, we talk about, uh, then after that, to say what's going to happen if you uh, the value that we try to store is too large or cannot fit in the signal base. We talk about this one, we have like either going to use overflow or maybe some database management system allow you or allow us in order to use external storage. So either way is fine because some of them has advantage and disadvantage. If you store the data as an overflow, so in this case you're going to get the, uh, I mean the uh, advantage of whatever the database management system is going to uh, offer in this case. For example, if the system crash or in case any errors, so it uh, allow you to have a concurrent access and control of this data and etc. If you store this information in an external source, then we cannot guarantee that's one basically the database. It depends on the operating system that we have here. Okay, so let me check firstly just to make sure that I'm the right one because I don't want it to have a, a repeat everything, okay? So, yeah, uh, storage model, yeah. So let's start the class, officially start from here. So I'm not sure whether you're going to add this one to the recording or not. Because, I mean, we just, I mean, summarize what we learned after last time. So anyway, so give me a second. You need just to jump to the storage database 2 here. Yeah, and they take a look to the slide 24 here. So here we're going to take a look at what? The way that to store the tuple in the base. How could you store the tuple in the base? Right now we're going to either, actually, either going to use the row store or the column store. That's the meaning here. So actually it depends on the the workload that we have here. So let's give you an example here, okay? By the way, when we talk about the relational data model or data model, that's excellent thing. Because in the relational data model, when you study this one, they didn't specify that that you have to store all these data and must be a double attribute that belongs to one relation, must store together on a single page. They didn't say anything, right? So we're gonna use this one in order to, have, to see or figure out a better way in order to store the data. Sometimes you're going to store all the attributes together in the single page, or maybe you're going to divide this more them, uh, them uh, divide them among, you say, different pages. So it depends on the workload. And what do you mean the workload? It depends what kind of query that we need to build or need to extract or need to perform. So assume that they give you this example, this sample version of the Wikipedia. We do have a three tables. The first one is going to have a user account. Okay, give me a second. The first one gonna be user account, which is gonna do what? User account keep information about the user. 
okay? Who create uh, or made a change to an article in the Wikipedia that contains the user ID and the username and maybe some uh, extra information. We do have another table called pages, and this table is gonna do what? It's gonna contain information or the latest version of uh, or for a particular page in general here. You have a page ID, the title of this page, and the latest is gonna be the last, gonna be reference, uh, uh, say, referential integrity, I would say, to uh, all the foreign key constraint associated with the uh, revision ID, okay? Then we do have a third table, we call this one create table. And this create table is uh, called, uh, sorry, uh, is a revision, okay? And so a revision is gonna what? It's gonna allow us to install all the new updates for every single page that we have in the system. When you talk about the every single page, I mean here an article in the Wikipedia. So if I have a user, and user a login to the system, and made a change in any page, so we're gonna keep store the revision version for the article here. And here we try to keep uh, in the page, just keep monitoring, I mean, keep tracking, I mean, or keep uh, having X to the latest, or contains the latest revision for a particular page or article. Okay, this structure looks like something, three tables, and this C take a look to different types of workloads here. So just speaking the database, actually there is different uh, types of workloads. And when you talk about the workload, uh, the actual meaning here, referring to, let's say, the general nature of the request of the a system will have to handle. For example, whether you're gonna have, have heavy, uh, let's say, uh, reading request or maybe have heavy let's say writing request whether we're going to have access to the a large amount of data or maybe you have a limited access to the data which kind of access data is going to be also be the same kind of acts or maybe have a different type of going to be repeated every time or not so the first type of the workloads is called this uh, online transaction processing and the second type is called online analytical processing with OLAP. And you do have actually the third type is called hybrid transaction uh, plus analytical, I mean, processing. So let's take a look one at a time. What's the online transaction processing here? The online transaction processing workload is characterized by the following. Fast query, fast access to the data, short running operation is not going to take long time. Okay, simple query is not complex query. Okay, we're gonna be operate maybe in single entity uh, at a time. For example, this is a simple example here. Maybe you log into your account and you wanna change your, for example, uh, your update username and password. Or you try to just to update last time that you log into the system, and etc. This kind of simple query. Or maybe you add a new revision instead just a revision. So simple query, fast, just I mean, ask maybe single file, I would say single entity, most of the case, then done. Okay, it's not complicated query. And the first query is just try to do what in this case, try to, uh, yeah, it's going to just achieve the la latest version of uh, given page. Give you the specific base, whatever, or for the particular page, then it's gonna retrieve, let's say, the count of the latest, I mean, revision of this page. Okay, of course, it give you a particular page. Good. That's one kind of the query here. The other kind of workload is called, as I mentioned, OLAP, was an online analytical processing. What does that mean in this case? This one looks like it's complicated a little bit. So this kind of workload is characterized by long running. It's gonna spend long time, you know, just long processing the data. Complex query. And generally speaking, gonna read the large, reads on a large portion of the data, then end up to drive a new information. For example, I want to check or see, for example, assume that you have an Amazon website, and if you try to perform the such query which allow you in order to find out, let's say, the uh, the most bought, what well, to say, uh, selling item during uh, or for every month or for a given month. So in this case, I want to ask the let's say the purchase for every single uh, let's say user that happened for every single month. So we are going to eat a huge amount of data in order just to derive in order to give me new data from existing data. Okay. So mainly analyzing, mainly we're gonna read a huge amount of data. It's not single account, multiple, many accounts. So in this case, give you an example here, based on the data that we have here. Assume that we're gonna have like, um, uh, 
Here I want to ask to find out to say the people they log in or the number of users they log in to the website from specific host name. Okay, their month. Count how many people or user log into the system. So I want to see at the beginning, for example, at the time for the specific host name, anyone log in from whatever ad uh, dot governed website. So I need to count how many people or how many user accesses at the time or per month. So it looks like you need to ask, you can ask everyone in the system. And you need to figure out from where this guy acts from. It depends on the IP address that you have. So you can get to, maybe you're going to store the host name that you use in order to access the system. So you need to extract like a piece of the, I mean, a new knowledge. So in this case, we're going to access a huge amount of data just in order to produce or give you a result. Okay? So it's complex. It's not uh, 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 easy. It's not fast, I mean. It's going to need a huge amount of data. The third type is called a hybrid transaction analytical processing, which allow you to do both of them in the same instance of the term. Uh, the same instance, I mean. Um, so this summarizes what you have said here. If for example, all, all online uh, transaction uh, processing here, which as you mentioned, fast, short running operation, they were based on the single entity at the time, perfect, more rights than needs, because most of the time, because you need to update, modify like uh, specific entity or small amount of data. Uh, I mean, operation gonna obey this one over and over. Of course, not the same user, but more the same, many users are gonna perform the same action. Usually, the kind of location that people build trust, because in this case, for example, you can load create and for the Amazon. Maybe we can every single user or let's say subscriber for the Amazon is gonna do what is gonna do the following. You're gonna try to navigate, search, uh, filling, adding to objects or whatever. Uh, items to the card or card, then after that, when you make the purchase, this is going to be simple because still I'm going to ask single entity, the user, small amount of data, navigate your item that you're looking for, then purchase, then done. Okay? This action will only affect the, the user account, no one else. Of course, the one that we're going to sell for them is going to be reduced by, reduced or reduced to say the amount of the number of items available there because you're the purchase one, but that's a different story. The OLAB, was, as you mentioned, is going to be online analytical processing. Actually, we cover these type of workload when you teach the CS4 to 5 for more details at the beginning. Just to tell you the users, we have to do mainly three different data types. And most of the time, we're going to use the online transaction processing. Unless you do data mining and machine learning, maybe we're going to do the online analytical processing here. So again, uh, the one example here, maybe you're going to try to compute the five most bought items or maybe the, the most bought item over one month or every single month. Maybe, for example, able people tend to use, for example, this item. For May, people tend to use that item. Or in this case, maybe you're going to try to find a specific number of most bought items over uh, one month. Period. So here in this case, you're gonna ask a huge amount of data, either a huge amount of data in order to give me the a new thing or something here. Okay. Um what else here? So now we have two different data. Uh, mainly we have two different uh let's say uh, workloads. Actually we have a three, but mainly we're gonna focus on two of them. Okay. So the goal here we need to figure out to find a way. To store the tuples on the page. How can you store them? Okay. So in the data storage model, there are different ways in order to store tuples in the base. Okay, we know which one are we gonna use. And right now, all of us we use what is called the NRA storage model, or the storage or the raw storage. So what does that mean in this case? You are going to store the all the tuples, or they say the columns of the attributes associated with every single tuple together as one unit. So you're gonna say this is tuple one, then after that is gonna say this is tuple two, all the data gonna be stored together in the same block. Okay? So we are not gonna split them. We are not gonna uh, say, uh, 
break it down in different pages. So in this case, I'm not going to say the first attribute or the second attribute of the page is going to be stored in this page. Then after that, the third and the fourth and the rest of the attributes are going to be stored in the another page. No, they're going to uh, store all the attributes for the single tuple continuously on the page. So if you do this one, now we take a look at different depends on the workload that we have. Whether this one is going to use or better uh, suitable for the online transaction processing or online analytical processing. So on online transaction processing, I want to ask to say information that relates to the one entity in most of the cases, right? So if we try to use the user account, so I believe if I get asked, I need to reduce the number of disk out of operation. If I fetch one block, to the main memory, so I'm gonna find all the tuples that, all the information that I'm looking for, for this tuple is gonna be stored in the same block, right? Otherwise, you're gonna perform multiple disk output operation, many disk operation in order to reconstruct the tuple that I'm looking for. So again, it's ideal for the all, uh, let's say online transaction processing here, workload. So mainly in this case, online transaction processing, uh, do what is gonna this kind of query is gonna operate only on the individual entity as a mission and insert maybe uh heavy workloads mainly insert uh, add new information or modify the say information related to that entity so if you try or looking for a specific page let's say i want to have let's say tuple five so the tuple five is gonna say the tuple five is gonna be the tuple id and gonna tell me the tuple is gonna be stored on the page five six for example it's going to be page number six, slot two. So if I store all the tuple five here as a one unit together, so I'm going to perform one disk arm operation, fetch this one to the main memory, search, jump to the slot two, and can find all the information that I'm looking for. So that's great. Okay, just the number of disk arm operations. Let's have a take a look at more details. Assume that we have this relation that we have, we talk about. We see, we said that we have table user account, a visual table, and the uh, the third one, the the page table, yeah, okay, or the pages in general. So I'm just take a look to way how can we store the user account. So the user account is gonna have for the tuple, gonna have the user ID, username, password, host name, and the last login. Assume that this information gonna store. Of course, the structure, the tuple is gonna have the header here, and here is gonna be the rest of the data of the information gonna be stored here. So this is the tuple one. Then after that, we can store the tuple two. Then after that, we can store tuple three. So it's going to be as one unit continuous. Good. So this is going to be stored somewhere here. Okay. So that's what is called, I mean, an array storage model or the row model. Okay. Remember, we're going to store all the attributes with a single tuple continuous in the base. What's the common box for us? When you try to create a database, store the data. That's what we're doing here. So let's give you uh, the, uh, two examples or two queries and see how these cases gonna be work. Whether it's gonna make sense in order to access the data or not, in order to help us in order to understand what's the advantage or disadvantage of these uh, queries here. Okay. So the first one we have two queries here. The first one is gonna uh, just try to retrieve the information about the user, right? the account information for a given user name. For example, the user name is the unique name or user ID that you use in order to identify a user. Okay, so if you give a username and password, they can achieve all the information associated with this. Okay, this one acquired. The other query is just try to insert a new information to the user account. For example, maybe you have a new user, can be attend or maybe enroll in the Wikipedia, whatever. So you need to just insert a new information to the user. Let's see how can we apply this one if we have an NRA storage model. Data can be stored or storage, and say, in this case, as you mentioned here, the database store all the attributes for a single tuple continuously in the same page or the single page. So the first word, assume that we do have an index, and we are going to cover the index next lecture, okay, hopefully. So the index is going to help you in order to perform what? In order to ask the data, Okay, and in order before going to jump to the file in the disk to fetch or search whether the pages exist or not, I'm gonna have like a special data structure. This data structure is gonna help me in order to navigate my way, in order to speed up the access to the disk. So this one gonna be later, which is gonna be by the way the fourth coding assignment for you guys. 
So in this case, it give you like, maybe assume that we're gonna build the index based on the username. So in this case, I just take the username, consult to look up for the index, and index is gonna say, username has this value, gonna store, this tool is gonna be found, let's say, in page seven. So the only thing you need to go, I need page seven, it's not available in the main memory, then I need to fetch it. So make your job easier. Otherwise, if you don't have this case, so what you plan to do in this case, you have to do before what's called sequential scan. Ask every single block that's all in this file until to find the one that has this kind of formation. So the index is going to speed up the ax. Anyway, so the index is going to be, this is the user ID name. And this is the, say, the tuple ID. This is the information going to be stored here. For multiple username, each of them can be find which is the tuple ID and allow me to fetch the data. Of course, the tuple ID can be page ID in the office within this page. Okay, anyway, you fetch just one. If it's not in the main memory, assume the index is available in the main memory. You're going to see the most of the keys index is going to be small size in most cases. So I'm going to say, based on the index, I'm going to fetch the specific block. So I'm going to perform one discount without operation. So all the formation is going to be formed here. I can find it. I have the user. Uh, I need to what? Find the username because it's value and the password. You get the username, you get the password, compare this one with the value that associated or given by the user. If they match, then you can return the user ID, username, and user password and host name on the last location. Perfect. One discount operation we have to perform the state. So it works perfectly here. Uh, the second query is that will allow uh, uh, us in order to insert a new user to the user account. So in this case, I'm not going to use index because I want to find what? I'm going to check the page directly. Page directly tell me, for example, page 5 has a free space to insert a new tuple. Fetch this page, one discount out operation to the main memory if the page does not exist. Then after that, I need to just to create or insert a new tuple. Then after that, reflect the change to the disk. So in the best case scenario, it's going to be two disk and out operation. Also in the worst case scenario, it's going to be two disk and out operation. Of course, there is no page available in the main memory which has space. If there is, it's going to be easy. It's going to be only one disk and out operation. Okay, so anyway, I can insert this one since I want to store this one in one block, so it's going to be make my life easier. So far, so good, hopefully. Just make sure that you are okay so far. Okay. Great. So take a look at this kind of query here and see. Assume the data is going to be in array, okay? And we're going to see whether this query is going to make sense or not. Whether it's going to be easy to execute this one using this kind of, let's say, storage model or not. Remember, in the array or the raw storage, what we have said, we said the database management system is going to store all the attributes for the single tuple continuously on or uh, in a page. So here, what I need from you to do, I need just to count the number of users, the login to say, uh, per month, this is before you, I need the last login, per month, okay, you need to count them, uh, where the host name was, the same from, or the access the system from the government, dot government, for example, or contains dot gov, okay? So in this, I think the reason behind this one, this query, years ago, the some people wrote bad thing about some, uh, I mean, the congressmen or senators. So the senators instruct their employee in order to ask the Wikipedia in order to change, write something different, to hide whatever information these guys or those guys uh, disclose. So that's why when you perform the square, you find out specifically per month they have many, too many users log in to the website in order to try to modify the content of the Wikipedia. That's why the square. Okay, so anyway, we try to perform this one. Let's show you the way how can you execute based on an array. So the first thing here, I need to do what? This is my query, and this is the data how it looks like. So I need to ask the, let's say, the user account uh, data. The first thing I need to perform here, I need to find first, you know, the order of execution, select where from, uh, go by, etc. The first query is going to be start from the form. Uh, execution, then after that you jump to the where clause, right? So from user account, this is the user account. So I said, I'm gonna fetch one block at a time in order to figure out, find out how can proceed here. You fetch one block at a time, 
Okay, and the, each block you're gonna check whether user account or user host name like dot government. So I check this bar, this column, right? That's what I need from this information. Then after that, if this one satisfy with uh, any trouble, satisfy the condition that we have, then after that you need to continue, yeah? So what's the, uh, the next step? I need just to extract the month for the last login here. So I need to ask, now I ask this block, uh, the column, and this column of those attributes, okay? Then I need to extract the last month or the month from this information. Then after that, you need to go by. Then after that, you need to just say, uh, compute the aggregate function. Then after that, you're going to produce a result. All right, that's what you're doing here. But the problem with this one, what we notice here. So it looks like, in this case, uh, if said to say, 60% of the data are wasteful. Useless data. Why? Because I'm not going to use this part. Did you use this part? No. The only thing for every single block, I'm going to use only 40% for the data that is stored in this block. And the 60% is not there. It's useless. Of course, from the 40%, maybe you don't need all of them because it depends on the condition. But since I'm going to ask actually uh, the uh, host name, so in this case, mainly we're going to use at least 20%. But how about the rest of the data that I never touched? In other words, those set of columns, the user ID, the username, and the user password. It's useless, yeah? I don't need them, right? So in this case, it looks like the way that you perform this operation is going to be too costly for me. Why? This kind of query can, doesn't fit this kind of data storage. Or in other words, this kind of data storage it's not allow me in order to write or not good for scanning large portion of the table, okay? Where, say, a subset of that will be that only required, okay? Why? Because it's going to pollute what is called the buffer goal. Remember, every time you try to fetch the data, the data is not available in the main memory. So you have to do what? Assume this is the main memory, allow me to have, let's say, three bases, okay? All of them are available or provided by something else. If the, I need to page one, page one is not exact. I need, uh, exist. I need to fetch this one to the main memory. But then after that, you have to take the next block. Remember, in this case, you have to access the sequential before sequential scan. Yeah? Every time I fetch the base was available in the main memory, it's going to cost one iron. And remember, we've said uh, at the beginning of today's lecture, actually, for the first time, I lecture when we talk about the database management system, we said we need to figure out a way. How can we reduce the number of discount operations? Because they are expensive, so we try to reduce the number of these kind of operations. Or it's got must be to say treat it definitely or handle definitely or be, be careful. Carefully, I mean. Yeah. So to summarize that here, the advantage of kind of this kind of storage you store you know, use, uh, say uh, the raw store. Just a quick reminder, the host store, that means the database stores all the attributes for the single tuple continuously to the, uh, in the page. The advantage is the fast, can perform insertion, update, delete, yes. Why? Because if you're going to try to access, let's say, uh, let's say your login information or user account information, etc., you're going to find all the information that you're looking for if you figure out to find the right block and the right page. So in this case, we did have problem. We're gonna perform one discount operation, and maybe two if you wanna perform update and delete and set. So good for queries that need to the entire tuple. So somehow my query required all the uh, attributes that are stored in this tuple. Bad, not good, as you mentioned, scan a large portion of the data, or you need just to have a subset of the attributes. In the tuple, for example, like the last query here, we have X only, let's say, two attributes from the out of five, yeah? So that's why we said well, almost 60% we should have to lose this data. So we're gonna take a look to the different way to how to organize the data on the tuple of the disk, okay? Here, we call this one decomposition storage model, or if you are familiar with the column store, this is the column store, okay? So in this case, like, uh, this is, by the way, is an alternative way to store the record or tuples on the desk. The column store system is going to vertically partition the database. You take a big database and partition over the table that we have, partition database over the table that we have into collection of individual columns that are stored separately. So in this case, actually, we're going to store the single attribute column for all the tuples continuously in the block of the data. So 
if the database or table or the tuple has the say five columns, every single column is going to be stored in, in separate block in this case. Okay? No, the mean here when you talk about the decomposition. No, for every single column or the single attributes, it's going to be stored to say uh, continuously in the block of the data. So you have one block contains, for example, the user ID for all the tuples. Then you have another block that contains, you say, the user name for all the tuples and etc. Okay? So we claim this one is going to ideal for the OLAP. Okay? Because OLAP, in this case, we're going to access, say, only portion of the data. And you're going to perform, like, read only queries. Okay? Which is going to perform the largest scans for a lot of, over a subset of the data. So not all of them. So mainly, for example, I'm interested in user ID and that's one. Or maybe they use uh, the host name and they say the last login. Only two columns of the whole data. So this kind of way, uh, of, uh, of course, so it's better to organize the data in the column way. So decompose using decomposition storage. Better than using the total storage model. So let's take a look how can you perform that. This is my data. This one is going to be stored one, together continuously in one page or one block of data. This one to another block, this one another block, this another block, and this another block. And that's what we have here. See that, for example, one block. Assume that one block is fit, can fit all the data. If not, that means you have you need to have an extra block, okay, more blocks. So here you see that this one, uh, decomposition storage model for the host name, all the host names are stored here, only contains information about the host name, all the tools. If you take a look at the last login, you're going to see this block contains all the last login uh, tool or attributes from every single tuple in the data. Okay? Good. Then the way organized by data. So let's take a look back at the square here to see whether it works out with us or not. Just to remind you with the square, try to do what? You're going to count the number of users, login, and let's say that website, per month, okay? In the way, uh, I need just to count these people, they log in from the uh, over to say where the host name was the government of the government host name okay so in this case let's try to execute this one using the composition see how fast will it gonna be doable or not so you take a look here first you start with where class you're gonna jump to the user uh, for example host name so this means you are gonna fetch the block that contains the information about the host name that's what we have right then after that, you need to perform what? Then after that, you will check the host name and see whether they like government or not. Assume, assume this one is say, let's say this and this one, and let's say, I need just to make it easier for me in the first here. Only those tuple or those values gonna satisfy the condition that we have. So it looks like the first one is gonna be tuple one, this is tuple two, and this is tuple four. Okay? So now you need to do what? You need to jump to the another block that contains the last login and you just to achieve or check or consider the first tuple, the first value and the second and the fourth value for the last login because those values that correspond to the value that the host name that like the govern or contains the govern or the host name that contains the value uh, of govern. What does that mean exactly here? It looks like, again, you try to figure out a way how can you match, you find match in one page, how could you figure out the match in another page? Let me try to formulate this one differently. Yeah. The host name, okay, and this is the first one, you're going to say this corresponding to the data from the first tuple. And the second value is going to correspond to the data for the host name for the second tuple. And this corresponding data for the third tuple. And so assume that we have 16 tuples, okay? Value can be stored in one block. Then, when you fetch the information about the last login here, take a look at the block to the last login. Let's say last login. The first one, the last login two, the, I'm going to show you the way how to organize this one, but this is the simple way to perform that. This one is going to contain the data from one up to 16 tuple. So the first one here, corresponding to the last login value that corresponding or fetched from the first tuple. This is for the second, uh, I mean, the last login value of the attribute last login that corresponded to the second tuple and etc. Okay, so in this case, if I said in my best page here uh, in the DSM, when I said I want to achieve the host name value, 
corresponding to the first and the second here. So the only thing I need to do here, I need just to check the first and the second. With that means the corresponding value for the tuple that I'm looking for. Okay? And now example said the fourth, that means also the fourth one. Okay? I'm gonna elaborate more about this one, but right now just I need to make sure whether it's gonna make sense or us. For us or not. Next slide, I'm going to show you how can we figure out, for example, if you had to have a match in one page, how can you find out the match in another page? Okay? So, what do you prefer this one? You see that how many discount out operations? Maybe you're going to prefer two discount out operations. Or, in other words, all the formation that's stored here is going to be needed here. Because I'm going to perform this guy, I need to perform a select or wear clause in this case. Yeah? So I'm not going to waste a lot of information, waste the data here. If you compare this one with an array, oh, an array isn't complicated because for every single fetch discount out operation, uh, I'm going to waste almost 60% of the data. So let's celebrate a little bit here to try to answer I mean, the question. How to figure out to find match in one page? How can you find the corresponding match in another page? Because we split the data based on the attributes, and each attribute is going to be stored in separate page for all the topics, okay? So we do have a two common ways. In order just to put the tuples back together, if you try to reconstruct the tuples, or if you find the match in another page, if you find or have a match in one page. The first one is called the fixed length offset. And the second way is called the embedded tuple ID. Let's start with the embedded one. No one do this one, by the way. So in this case, you're gonna have what? The way that you saw this one for Remember, this we have one attribute, okay? And this is another base, and this is another base. For every single base, what we're gonna store here, assume that we have attribute A, B, C, D. So each of them is gonna be separate base. But in this case, you have to add one extra piece of information for every single value that corresponds with this attribute for every single base. You have to include the primary key of this tuple as a part of the uh, data that's gonna be stored there. So for every attribute in the column, the database management system is gonna store a tuple ID, which in this case is gonna be the primary key here. So your tuple ID from zero, one, two, three, and here you can specify the value here. So now, if you try to figure out, for example, I need to find the match for page ID equal two, the only thing you need to do when you jump to the next page, you just say, I need to offset for the page two. Uh, then the, you need to retrieve the value of C, Corresponding that the value is a match of the A. So in this case, you're gonna say I need just to ask the base of the let's say the attribute two and etc. for the C. This is not a good idea, okay? Because what we'd like to do, we're gonna add extra piece of information, okay, which end up we have larger storage overhead. Yeah? So we don't use this one. Which is the less common approach in general. This is do, to be in safe slide, we say this is the less common approach. So how about the fixed length offset? The fixed length option, okay, was the most commonly used approach. So you assume that all the attributes are gonna have the fixed length. Remember, we give you the example in previous slides. I said assume that every single block can store 16 base, I would say 16 entry or value. So that's be 16 tuples. Of course, I'm not gonna store the tuple, but I'm gonna store only you say a single attribute for tuple. Okay, so it looks like in this case what we did here. We assume that all the attributes, in this case, let's have this example, A, B, C, D, all of them have the same size. Okay. All they have, let's say, fixed length, it's better fixed length. So the size here, for example, 32 bits, 32 bits, 32 bits, 32, 32, 32, 32, 32, 32, 32. okay. So in this case, the database can compute the offset of the attribute for each tool. Right? Because in this case, if in my data, that's what I'm like to do here. So this is the first, the second, and the third here. And each of them is gonna have like, I know that the first one, the offset zero, one, two, three, that means in this case, assume that the page that produced or contains that to beat A, it's gonna have what? This is the first value, okay? The offset zero. Remember, we have a slotted page, a slotted array here. Then after that, it's gonna be the second value. This is gonna be slotted, the third value, and such. So it looks like the slot offset 0, 1, 2, 3, and the center was going to tell me was going to be the first slot, the second slot, and the third slot. Okay? So assume that you want to retrieve only the value that's in the second slot. So the offset is going to be 2. 
assume this one, assume the offset two, simplicity, okay? So if we try to retrieve the value for B, since all of them have the fixed length, so all of them are gonna have the same number of tuples or value that be stored per page, right? So in this case, the only thing I need to do, I need to jump to the offset two in order to achieve the corresponding value for this attribute, okay? How about if you have a variable length fields? For example, not all of them have the fixed length. One way to do this, we well, have different ways in order to handle them, okay? The system may be gonna have a bad field so that all of them are gonna have the same length. And see, take a look, A, B, C, D, and the highest one, the largest one, D, that contains, for example, 64 bits, just for example, okay? And there's 32, maybe plus minus. So what I'm gonna do, I expand or add banding to make sure that all of them are gonna have 64 bits in order to achieve this goal, find the better way in order to store the data as a column-wise, okay? Or maybe you can use it like a dictionary in order to take, for example, fixed size integer and maps the integer to the value here, somehow. Okay, this is the dictionary, this one way we can perform this operation, okay? So the advantage for the decomposition storage model, reduce the amount of the waste and discount the outer operation as you mentioned here, depends by the way the query. So because when you fetch acts in the base, that means you get a, a, a all the formations that are looking for, for example, I'm looking for, remember the kind of query in this case, we from counting, we from average, uh, maximum, minimum, etc. So you do perform what's analytical. Uh, analyze, for example, data. It's a huge amount of data. And in most of the cases, you didn't need to ask the entire tuples or the attribute that associated with each tuple. And it's just to ask the same portion of the data of the tuple. So it's going to be worked perfectly here. Okay? Of course, it's going to allow us to have before what's called the uh, data compression. I'm not sure if we're going to have a time to talk about the data compression in uh, this class, but maybe give you during the class, maybe give some few papers if you're interested to learn more. I will introduce you, talk about this a little bit, but we are not going to spend a lot of time to cover this one. So anyway, so since all, for example, the value for the same attributes are stored continuously, we're going to be stored the same thing. So maybe you're going to have like, uh, maybe the data are going to store the temperature, okay? And assume the temperature here, instead you said temperature per month, or monthly temperature. So we have, for example, 31 value. So the first one that is to give it a temperature of that first day of the month, it looks like today's 90. I'm talking about my country, okay? So the second value for the second tuple for the temperature, will be, for example, 100, and etc. So instead of store all the formations, since we have the first, the second, up to the 31st month, a day in the month, so maybe you're gonna use what? Instead of having to gonna compress them. So instead of store the entire value, maybe you're gonna say, okay, the first value is gonna be 90, then the second value 10, plus 10, because I'm just see the difference between this value and the next value. And the third value, 50, so it means, for example, uh, let's say, uh, minus 50, something like this. So you can have some way in order to convert the data that we have here, okay? Disadvantage is slow for the point query. If you have a point query that acts the entire relation, uh, insertion updates, that's a bad idea to perform this one, and do you know why the insertion and update? If you try to insert a new tuple, remember that means in this case, assume that you, let's take out the example, back to this one, assume that I'm going to insert, to say, in this relation, a uh, new tuple, and this, I need to specify the value of A, B, C, D attributes, okay? When you try to insert this one, I need to perform what? I need to read for this output out operation. And the first one, I need to store the value of A. That means I need to write this one again. Then I need to store the, uh, read the column that contains, the, say, the attribute B. Fetch the main memory, store the new value for the B, then after that, reflect the change to the disk, and etc. So in this case, we end up we have five, eight disk and without operation, just in order to insert one tuple, which is painful, yeah? But it depends on the kind of query on the workload that we have here. So if you have like point queries, insertion, updating, and et cetera, so it's, it's better to work with the NRA storage of that amount, uh, storage model or the, uh, what's it called, I mean, the uh, row star. Okay? Any questions?
Great. So I'm going to take a look just to handle and give you a quick overview if we try to modify, let's say, a tuple in general. So how to handle the following operation on the tuple level in general. And search and deletion and update. Just to give you an idea. Okay. okay. So... I think I do have example related. Do you need to have example? Let's have a quick example first with this one, just to simplify, give you an idea what's going on. Okay, assume that we have this data. Okay, we have uh, relation R. This is for the way that organize the data, tuple wise, or they say tuple overall. Okay, storage model. Relation R contains A and B attributes. Okay, and the attribute A is, for example, two bytes. And B, maybe one byte. Okay. So assume that the value that we have, maybe we have 10, 20, 10, for example, A, 20, B, 30, C. Okay. This is the data that we have in my relation. Then I want to show you, just to show you the row oriented storage, how it looks like. Assume that uh, we do have, like, we can store six bytes in each page. And without the page header and the tuple header. Okay? So in this case, it looks like in the block one, I can store the following information. Okay? I can store, let's say, 10 and A. The total is going to be 2 plus 1 is 3. And then after that, I can store 20 and B. This is what's called the row oriented, right? Then the block two, so we say the, the size of the block can store 6 bytes. Okay, the block two only store, I mean, the rest will be 30 and C. The column oriented, the way that stores the data is different. In the block one, assume they still have the same assumption. Each block can store six bytes. It can store in this case, so I'm going to take a look only A. The block one is going to contain all the information about the A. So I'm going to have a 10, 20, and 30. All right? And the block two, I'm going to have. Uh, the formation that's drawn to the P, so it's going to be A, B, and C. And still they have a space, maybe you have three more if you want to insert, if you have. So this is in order to visualize the way how to organize the data, how it can be stored. Of course, the block, we just have a block is six bytes, and then it is not small like this. So anyway, back to how can we perform some operation on the top of the page level, okay? The first one, you need to perform the insertion, then after the deletion, then after that, I can take a look at the update. We do have an easy case. What does that mean in this case? Tuple has a fixed length. Actually, we have some tuples going to have variable length. Okay. Sometimes the tuple maybe contains multiple information, not fixed. Not all of them going to have, for example, A, B, C attributes through the tuple. Sometimes data have multiple at value. Okay. Uh, even the size that we have here. For example, we try to store string or var char. The var char can have, for example, some of them have five characters, some of them, uh, the, for example, B is the name of the last name. Some last names of the, some students are have maybe required two, three characters, or two, you see, bytes. Some of them require for have to store 20. That's one thing. The so size of tuple might be, or they say, it's going to be different. The second thing here, maybe we have some attributes not listed for every single student or user in general. Sometimes you need to store the dependent information. For example, say employee. ID, employee name, and say dependent one, dependent two, dependent three, and etc. Number of dependents. So there's some de uh, employee maybe have many, de many dependents. Some employee doesn't have dependents. So some of them gonna contain only employee ID, employee name, and there's gonna be no value. Some of them gonna have employee ID, employee name, and maybe have two dependents. So the size gonna be is not is gonna be variable. It's not gonna be fixed length. Okay. Anyway, so assume the tuple has a fixed length. The simple thing. Okay. Not the sequence. I don't want to data that be stored in sequence. So this means I know it's not required from you to have like sequential order. Okay. So in this case, in order to insert a new total, so since the record is not in sequence, in order to insert a new record, I'm going to insert this one at any place. Okay. Uh, maybe it's going to be at the end of the file. There's one way in order to perform that. Okay. Or if there's any available delete slot, I'm going to insert this tuple there. Okay. So this is the easy case. A little harder in this case, it can be if the record, by the way, has a variable size. 
If it's not a fixed size, so it depends here. If the, let's say, the space available can fit variable size, so I'm going to store there. Otherwise, sometimes require from you to what? If you, you cannot reuse really a space, maybe require from you to know that to do fragmentation. Sometimes we need to split the data among or the, for the tuple among two, you say, blocks. Which is expensive operation because you need to figure out a way how to reconstruct them. The difficult case is the tuple in the sequence. You need to keep them sorted or ordered. So in this case, you need to find the place, right, the right place in order to keep the data stored here. So what does that mean here? The data in this case assume that we have a tuple 1, tuple 5, and tuple 6. Then now we need to insert tuple 2. So we need to figure out a way whether this block has enough space in order to store tuple 2 or not. If not, that means maybe tuple 6 is going to be moved to another next block. And then tuple 5 sliding down, keep a space for the tuple 2. When you ask the data, it's going to be in sorted order here. Okay? That's what we're doing, uh, what you mean if we do, it required for me to do slide following tuples. If the tuples are sequ sequenced by linked lists, for example, or maybe you can do this something different here. You can use insert overflow blocks, which is going to make your life easier, I mean, in this case. Then later, I'm going to say, okay, I am going to reorganize the data. I'm not going to waste my time. I'm going to uh, add this is some database management system do that, or the system do that, database application do that. <coughs> okay. Deletion. When you delete something, I think you're gonna, you are going to blame this one in the coding assignment later. You try to delete something, okay? And when you delete one record, we need to make sure that if there's another record that belongs to this record that you just delete, you need to handle this situation, okay? So let's take a look at the simple thing here. Maybe I can delete and immediately reclaim the space. If there's no one other record, for example, point to this record. For example, I have a record, let's say tuple or record uh, one or tuple one. I delete this one. I can remove this one safely if there is no another tuple two, two or two, three, which is going to point to this tuple. Okay, sometimes you have a tuple that's going to have an entry within this uh, field, one of the fields that's stored in this tuple is going to be point to have access and point to, the, say, to another tuple. Okay? So, anyway, many options when you delete any tuple. The first one, we can delete this one, then after that, immediately reclaim the space. This is one option. What do you mean reclaim space? That means I'm going to find, if I keep the space in one place, or maybe you reuse the space immediately. It's going to be available for the future, for the use. The second option is mark delete, and then later I'm going to handle this one later. Okay? So you can mark this one, delete, and we're going to talk about different ways how to mark this one. Maybe you add extra piece of information, say, whenever we have any tuple point to this tuple, this tuple now does not exist anymore. Okay? So it looks like we have a trade-off between what? With how expensive you're going to immediately reclaim space. Because when you reclaim space, for example, assume that this, we have one block and this block had an overflow. If you delete one tuple from here, so you have free space, and maybe you have one tuple that an overflow block. So now you're going to move this, whatever, the tuple and the overflow block into the original block or the primary block, then you're going to delete this one. But this is going to be costly operation, right? Yeah, that's the meaning here. How much, uh, for example, space of waste? If you just mark this one for delete and you didn't delete this one. Okay? So let's take a look at the example here. Assume that we have, let's say, a tuple x1 and x2, and we have another tuple called y. Okay, we're going to use like the physical address. What's the physical address? I'm not going to use the logical address. I'm going to directly point to this one to the record ID. Okay, which contains the information about the record. Where the record is going to be stored here. Okay? So, both of them, they're going to have like pointer to the record Y. If you delete Y here, now we have a problem because the record X1, X2 still pointing to the record Y, which does not exist anymore. So we end up, we have the reference going to be incorrect. So we can use, in the hand of deletion, we can use what is called the map table. So in this case, we're going to have like, create a logical address, where it's going to be mapping for every single logical address to the specific 
uh, physical address. For example, physical address is going to be, for example, the path or a page, uh, say, you know, give me more details where the data is going to be stored in the disk, which track with the cylinder and which block and etc. And which disk too. Okay? So instead of use this one directly, the physical address, assume that we can say the logic address starts from 1, 2, 3. So 3, that means everyone now we're going to use a 3, and 3 is going to be point to the physical address of y, where the y is exist in the desk. That's what we call the map table here. So now when you delete here this tuple from the y, all you need to do what? Just to mark this one into the logical map or map table as a null. So any block, we try to we say any other tuple, we try to reference to this block or this tuple, we're going to reach this point, we're going to say, okay, we still have a three logical address, but the logical address is going to point to none. So that means in this case, I know that, okay, the tuple that I'm trying to reach is deleted, it's not available anymore. So back to this one here, uh, in the physical, if you don't use what's called I mean, the logical or the map table, so in this case, if you delete this one here from the Y, you need to update all the address that reference to this tuple and every single tuple available there, which is going to be cost your version, yeah? Because now, no more point to this block, uh, or this area, or this area might be used by another tuple, so we do have a problem here, if I didn't update this data here. So that's why using the map table is going to simplify the process here. And very important point here, these values that store the logical address is not going to be like you used at the same time. Okay, if you, so that means as long as the data is working, uh, you didn't reorganize the data, so you cannot use reuse the, let's say, the logical address tree. Unless, like, if you want to reuse this one, the data, you have to reorganize the data. That means you have to build, rebuild everything. So in this case, yes, you can reuse, because three is not going to be available here. Maybe use a different number here. Another way to know that to just, to, I mean, to handle deletion of the tuple is Tumstone. What does that mean, Tumstone? Tumstone is like a special record or tuple, very small, and the purpose of this tuple, just in order to represent that this area to, of this tuple used to be an existing tuple, now is not exist anymore, this is a deleted tuple, or has been deleted tuple. Just indicate that there is a toggle in general. So this is the way how can we leave mark in map or say on the old location. So for example, if you take a lock here in the block here, see if that this block looks like something like this. And this here we have to say one trouble, then we have another trouble, then we have another trouble here. Now I delete this toggle. So what I'm gonna do here, if this is toggle one, let's say toggle one, toggle two, toggle three. You delete toggle two. So it's, in this case, what we're going to do, I'm going to just insert Tumstone here. Let's say Tumstone, someone's dying. There used to be a nice guy, nice tuple. Then after that, what about this one you cannot reuse, this area that's used for the Tumstone, or Tumstone. And the rest of the area here for the two, two can be reused. If you want to store this one. This space can be reused, this space cannot. Okay, because they need to keep, because right now we have, for example, tuple 5 and tuple 6, both of them may be pointing to the tuple 2. So in this case, you're going to be pointing to the beginning of tuple 2, you're going to be Tumstone, so we know that the data is deleted, or tuple does not exist anymore. This is if you're going to use the physical address. If you use the logical address, you can use this one as a null value, as we did before. Yeah, the null value that signify that, or you get enough mark that tell me that the value of this tuple does not exist anymore. Okay, so here again, so if that you have a y, uh, two tuples, uh, x1, x2, point to the address, uh, another tuple y, and this here within the physical of this block that contains the formation, and this is the area that's assigned for the tuple y. Okay, if you delete this one, what I'm saying is, so in this case, it's going to be Tom record, or this space cannot be reused or never reused until you reorganize your data. When you organize the data, now we're gonna find whatever delete gonna be deleted, and here we can say maybe add no value or use a different way in order to notify that it's not exist anymore. And how about the rest here? The area here, yeah, can be oh this space can be reused normally. Okay. Update. We try to update the data at the bits. 
if the new tumble, if you remember when you fetch the tumble for update, you're gonna modify something. Maybe you add something, you delete something else. So if the new tumble is shorter than the previous one, it's gonna be easy. Because if for example you have 1000 or let's say 100 bytes for the tumble, you modify this one, reduce the size to the 50 bytes. Yeah, so because the price is enough in order to store this tumble. If longer than this means you need to figure out, depends whether you're going to try the same thing, the same problem that we cover or go over when try to insert the data. So either going to be use a shift tool, or you have to slide down by the place with the data, or maybe you're going to create an overflow box. It depends what you'd like to do here. Of course, we're not going to use a tombstone here because we are not going to delete the tumble. Of course, you're going to remove the tumble, but it's not top store because now the tuple when you remove this one of course you're going to delete the old one and store the new one yeah but you're going to use the same tuple id here so you can still manage in order to exit so that's all of this part we talk about the different ways how the storage manager how can you store the data on the desk then we talk about the different way how can we organize or, or i mean how can we store the database the workload either going to be row store or the column store and it depends whatever workload that you try to achieve try to use if a way in order to organize the data going to be suitable for the different workload so here we're done for the problem one and now we need to figure out take a look at the problem two in the problem one, remember we said how can we lay out the data on this so we said here we have a file, we have a sequence of pages, and we're going to use a page directory in order to track down how, I mean, in order to figure out where the page is going to be stored in the desk, or which where the page exists or not. And we take a look there inside the each page, how it looks like. Then we mainly we're going to use a slotted page array in order to store the data within the page. Then after that, we'll look at the different way how can we lay out the tuple inside the page itself. Then after that, we folks who went over with more details, how can you store the actual component value for every single attribute that's stored in the tuple, inside the tuple, here. Now the next part, or the next part we need to think about, how the database management system is gonna manage its memory and move the data back and forth from the desk. So what it actually means? So that means you have a file data stored in the desk, and now you need to find or talk about the buffer pool. So in this case, we have the page directory, we have page one, page two, this is the page directory, page one, page two, and etc. Um in the high level, the query engine, maybe or the database engine asks for the page, whether the page exists or not. I need page five. So first you need to check with the buffer pool, with the page available in the main memory or not. If not, you have to fetch this page. Who's gonna decide? Who's gonna do, for example, figure out the best way in order to organize this or implement this uh, task. The database management system knows better than operating system. We are not going to rely on operating system. So we're going to see how can we build our own buffer pool. Okay. So we're going to take a look here. In order to remember, we talk about the database management system. We said they have goals here. We need to allow the database management system to what? To manage database that exceed the amount of memory available. In other words, it looks like when you design our database management system, it's going to give illusion to the user that all your data is going to be available in main memory. So try to find the way of tricks of data structure that allow me, for example, when the user said or the high level said, I need page 10, I'm going to say, here you go, that's page 10, it's available. I'm not going to try to do my best in order to put all the data that the user needs in the main memory, as much as it can. Okay? So, now take a look how the database manages its memory and move data back and forth from the disk, which is going to be coding assignment too. Powerful. Okay. So we talk about this one. Uh, the question here, someone said, why don't you rely on the data the operating system going to take care of this operation? You know the virtual memory, yeah? So anything you try to access the disk must be resides in the main memory, so we're going to use the virtual memory in order to expect the access of the data. Okay? Here, we don't rely on the operating system going to take care of this one, because we said last time the database management system knows better than the operating system. And today, I mean, starting with today's lecture, hopefully after we finish this chapter, we're going to be convinced that exactly, database management system knows better because we can do one, two, three, four, five, and the operating system cannot tell. We cannot do it. And the simple, I mean, uh, let's say argument here, you can say, okay, remember last time, or at the end of the previous part, 
or the notes three, we know exactly how the disk based management system is going to interpret or decipher the sequence of bytes that's stored in the disk. Yeah? Because you are wonder who stored or convert or whatever value of the attributes into corresponding, let's say, ASCII code or what other, uh, sorry, bytes, is the database management system. And the database management system can't tell what's the difference, what's going on inside these bytes. Okay? Operating system doesn't know anything about this one. All you know, you know, oh, those are a bunch of, you see, bytes. I don't know what's going on, sequence of bytes. Anyway, so the database is going to be what? It's responsible for managing its memory, moving data back and forth from the desk. So we're going to, instead, do, we're not going to rely on the operating system. The database management system is going to take care of this one. Because later, remember, we, as when we start this part, I said, okay, someone at the high level said, I need page one or two, page 10 or whatever, okay? And they need to make sure that whenever the user asks for the page, page I will try to make my test in order to gonna make this page is gonna be available in the main memory. For example, if we have like most or set of pages, let's say the most frequent access pages, for example, page one, two, three, four. So the operating system, for example, when you take out the buffer pool of, uh, let's say, virtual memory, maybe you have this space. This one allow me only to store only four bases. I store page one, two, three, four. Okay. Then later, they have another query. Ask for page five, six, seven. Five, six, seven, eight. Then now we have another query. Ask for one, two, three, or maybe two, three, uh, or different process or uh, threads. Try to ask or ask for page one, two, three, four. I lost them. Or maybe ask for page one, two. Those are the most frequent pages, just to simplify the I mean, example. So you see that I just lost them because the operating system, is relying on the operating system, operating system cannot tell this is important or not. I don't care, I have a space, it depends on the placement policy, maybe first in, uh, uh, first out, yeah, or something like this. So just they need to have free space because they need space to, in order to fetch page from the main memory to the desk. Yeah, but for the database managers, they can tell, say, oh no, one and two are important. Keep them, don't release them. You need space, get rid of the rest. Because one of them, we need them. Because I know that many users access one, and based on the chart, I mean, the X way that the data gonna be asked to, then I'm gonna tell, you're gonna see during today's, uh, this part, how can the database manage, I'll say, those are the set of, let's say, uh, let's say, Pages are very important. Let's think of the example. Assume these pages maybe contains the index. Yeah? So index, pages that contains the index, very important. Because every time any query to actually access the data or this relation, it's going to go through this index. If you remove this index from the main memory, so this means, again, you try to access the data, you have to fetch the index or the blocks that go pages contains the index data in order to access them, in order to tell me which page they need to retrieve. That's one example. The operating system cannot tell that. But the database management system can tell, oh no, that's important, leave it, keep it, okay? And the other problem here, why cannot operate directly on the data, on the disk? We assume that, I think there's some uh, effort that you can perform some chip of hardware that allow you to perform some competition on the hardware on the disk. We ignore this one, for simplicity right now, Whatever I need to operate, I mean, uh, run, uh, work on or operate or ask, modify, etc., must be resides in the main memory in order to perform this operation. Okay? So, the way that I'm going to handle this, or the way that to say, uh, think about this problem in terms of the spatial versus temporal control. Because remember, I need to do what? I need to find the way the base on the desk, then I need to fix the base that I need into to the main memory. And also, I need to reduce what's called I mean, the stall. I, I, I missed this one, yeah? I need to stall, uh, reduce, I mean, the stall would say, uh, or the delay that may occur every time you try to access the data on the desk. The way that you lay out the data on the desk is gonna help you. Remember, we talk about if we put the data in sequential order next to each other, so it's easy to ask the data, yeah? Only you need to spend one X time, then after that, they're gonna be for what? The rest is gonna be what? It's gonna just, I mean, uh, transfer rate, yeah? But if you have to spread the data everywhere, that means they need to back and forth, every time you need to perform X drive. 
jump from sector 1 to cylinder 1 to cylinder 16, back to cylinder 5, back to cylinder 20 or 80, and etc. Okay? And the other part of here, I need to minimize the fault. When you fetch the data on the desk, I need to make, I don't need to spend this one every time or do this one every time the, the high level asks me to bring the page, I am going to go over the expensive operation. And the same thing here, you need to think about the way that uh, how or when you read the data in the page, okay? When you need to keep the data in the page, in the main memory, we need to decide which bit you're going to get read here. Remember, we're going to talk about the puffer pool in general, and you see that like you have a number of frames, like slots, available in the memory, allow you to store, for example, 100 pages. If there are all of them full, then what you need to do here, you need to find, and you need to read more pages, or new pages, you need to find this uh, place of policy or strategy, which tell you, for example, which page you need to get read, or let you say, the candidate page that, or, or vector page you need to get read or vect from the buffer pool in order to free space to the new page. Okay? So, again, so another way to think about this problem in terms of the spatial and versus temporal control. What do you mean the spatial? The spatial the same way uh, when you talk about the way that when or lay out the data on the desk, the order, etc. So generally speaking, is going to refer to what? The spatial here. Where the pages are physically written on desk. Okay? Uh, where you are going, for example, physically to write uh, these data on desk, whether next to each other or spread everywhere. Okay? And what the goal to try to achieve here, make sure that to keep the pages that are used together often as physical clothes together as possible on desk. And it mean sequential. In the same cylinder, uh, the same try at the same cylinder, then after that you don't have more space, jump to the next cylinder. So the same track, the same cells, the same cylinder. You see that? We talk about this one, we talk about sequential here. And you know the reason why? That's why we spend some time that try to convince you that we try to ask the data from the desk, the complex operation, ask time, seek time, rotation delay, and transfer rate. But if you put the data next to each other, sequential, all you need just to find the first block. Then after that, once you finish reading the first block, you already know at the beginning of the next block. So the only thing you need to do is transfer rate here. Okay? Or transfer delay in this case. Uh, the second part of the product here, which is what you call, I mean, uh, the temporal control in this case. So in this case, what do you mean? It refers to make decisions, okay? Or decide when to read the vision to memory and when to write them to desk. So it looks like you need to find, like, a mechanism or replacement policy, smart one, that allow me, for example, to say, okay, this page, if you need more space, you need to evict this page. Or, if you modify one page, we're going to say, okay, before we do anything, this page must be written back to the desk. Okay? So, timber control aims to what? To minimize the number of stalls, okay, from having uh, the query that we're going to perform to read or fetch data that's not in the memory uh, from desk. If you don't have smart policy or replacement policy, uh, so in this case, it gonna have for every maybe it's gonna be cause you for every single uh, reading or query uh, when someone asks in a high level for a specific page you have to enforce it in order to fetch the data on the desk if you don't have smart rate so we're gonna see how can you the first one we did it with spatial control we said store the data sequentially each next to each other close to each other physically which allow us to reduce I mean increase the sequential acts of the data and reduce the what's it called I mean the random acts of the data. The second one, temporal control, now we're gonna cover right now, today. We're gonna see how can we achieve this one using the buffer pool, how can you build this one, how can we come up with the replacement policy smart, and how can we do some optimizations? Hopefully you're gonna see that, oh, database management system do a better job than the operating system. Rely, we didn't need to rely on the operating system can take care of this one. I speak so fast. Hopefully not. So, we're going to start today, talk about the first part, what do you mean by the buffer pool? How it looks like? What's the structure? Then after that, as I mentioned, since we're going to see, uh, uh, we need to decide when to read pages, when to fetch pages, uh, write them back to the desk, which one you're going to choose if you don't have space to free more space in order to add or let's say uh, fetch new page to the main memory, which one, how can you keep one in the main the most frequent one, and etc. 
uh, that's where they're going to be the place of policy here. Okay, we're going to cover have to cover some of them in the I think yeah in the uh, coding assignment you're going to do the simple replacement policy here. Okay, and other memory pools are going to take a lot. For example, uh, other data systems that need memory in general. Okay, you're going to see not the buffer pool. You have another memory space or you need to locate some memory. Uh, location for the other components of the data system. You're gonna see uh, some of them, okay? Okay, so what's the buffer pool? The buffer pool is like a region into, you say, a memory, a place, yeah? Memory location, you can malloc, and you know, to say, I need this space of the memory, and gonna be allocated to the buffer pool, okay? And this one is gonna be organized as an array of fixed size pages. And this six fixed size space, we call this one as, I mean, a frames, okay? If you take a look here, this is just simple thinking. You can assume that these are frames that we have. Here, I have a puffer pool. This puffer pool can contains, in this, our example, four frames, okay? But like fixed size base size chunks, okay? So each array entry, assume that you have array one, two, three, four, okay? In this case, it's, a, it's called a frame, as I mentioned. And as I mentioned, a frame is like corresponding to the region in the buffer that you can put pages in. So inside that, we take page from the main memory, uh, sorry, from the disk, we try to put in the buffer board, you're going to put this one into frame, okay? With the location on the buffer board. And the size of the frame is equal to the size of the page in the, main, in the disk. So four kilobytes, then you have four kilobytes. So each frame can allow you me in order to store one page. Good. So that's the simple thing, okay? Okay, so take a look here. When the database manager system, for example, try to fetch page from the memory, okay? Or let's say assume that in the high level, at the beginning, the frame is, or the buffer pool is empty. So when you try to, for example, I want, I want to have the same example, I want to have, X page one on the high level, okay? Query or whatever, uh, query engine. As I said, okay, please, I want to ask page two or page, uh, page one, yeah? So in this case, your system is gonna check the buffer pool. Do you have a page two one? No? So what you need to perform here, now we need to fetch the page or copy the page from the main memory. When you uh, from the disk, sorry. When you perform this one, you know that the first page you need to fetch is the page directory in order to tell you exactly where can I find the page that I'm looking for. Yeah, we assume the page directory is somewhere. Okay, then the page directory tell me that the page one is gonna be there, then I will fetch this one into the buffer pool, into specific frame. Assume that I want to have another page, page two, page two, uh, let me, uh, page two is not exist in the buffer pool, so in this case, I need to perform one disk input auto operation and fetch the page two in the main moment. So now, if you have any query, ask, I need page one, page two, page, uh, or page one, or page three, for example. The system gonna check for us, with the available buffer pool, I'm gonna apply where the, let's say, corresponding the uh, memory address and the memory. If not, I have to perform this kind of auto operation in order to fetch the data to the desk, uh, to the main memory. Okay, so here, just back here, I assume that the page one and page three here. We choose page three, we skip page two because just we need to emphasize that the order doesn't matter. Maybe I'm gonna fetch the page in different order than the order that the page is gonna be stored in the desk. Doesn't mean, for example, the data contains for page one, page two, page three, page four. This means I have to fetch page one, page two, then after that, page three. It depends what you're looking for. Maybe you need page one, then after that, page four, page 16, and etc. So the orders are not the same. The one thing I need to add here, when you fetch or fetch load the data from the disk to the main memory, you are going to copy whatever the page con content is going to be here. As one block chunk. Do you have here? Copy here. Copy and paste. That's what I'm gonna do. So the same structure, the same format, the same bytes, it's gonna be the same thing that either the base is gonna be uh, in the desk or it's gonna be in the buffer board. Okay, the exact match copy. It's gonna be, uh, I mean, fetch here. Good. So in order to access the data here to see whether it exists or not, the same thing here that we talk about when you organize the data, we said the file is going to be organized as a sequence of what? Pages. Okay. When you put this one file in the pages here, you need to find the way. How can you find my way? How can you tell whether the pages exist or not? Yeah? That's in the, in the disk. 
The same thing in the Parfa Vore. When you put the data here, you have several bases. How can you tell whether the page that I'm looking for is exist or not? Someone said, okay, you need to scan the entire Parfa Vore. Okay, that's expensive. Can you do another way? Yes. We can build the data structure in the top of the Parfa Vore, which help me just to show me that expedite the access to the data. Yeah, we can use hash table in this case. With the built hash table, which allow me in order to access the data here, in general speaking. Okay. So anyway, so in this case, the hash table is going to be built as a base table. Or oh, another, it's better to say base table here. So we're going to have a metadata. It's going to tell me, for example, whether what page are, exists there. How can I reach them? And another thing, we need to have more extra information. For example, assume that we have page, all the page frames are full here. Okay? Or oh, I'm just going to say, okay, I need to delete one page. For some, let's assume all we have page four, four, and two here. I need to delete one of these pages. Which one are you going to choose here? I need access to a piece of information metadata to tell me whether it's safe to be, for example, delete page three or not. What if we have the multiple threads access this page at the same time right now? So I cannot delete the page that's used by another process or another thread. So I need extra piece of information. Something that tell me, for example, we do have like five different threads that access this data right now. Something like this, okay? Uh, another thing here, when you try to delete a, de a page, okay, from this buffer pool, you need another extra piece of information to tell you, for example, whether you need to reflect the change that you have made by any process or any threads to the disk or not. That's what's called dirty pages. Okay, so we need to keep tracking number of users or number of threads that act specific page, and they need to keep tracking, for example, whether the base has been modified by any, uh, let's say, thread or any process, okay, after we fetch from the memory, uh, disk or not. If yes, that means before you get rid of this one, you have to store it back or reflect the change back to the disk. So you see that we need to have extra piece of information and tell me how can we deal handle the situations here. So how can we do that? We're gonna do what is called I mean the uh, page table. Okay? Which is the simple thing. I will add another piece or another layer here. We'll call this one the page table. The page table is gonna do what? It's gonna give me the page ID and map whatever the page ID I'm looking for with the frame ID. Remember, the data is in the buffer pool is frames, yeah? And when someone said, I want page 16, how can I tell where is the page 16, which frame? So I need to find a level of interaction or mapping, give as an input the page ID, and the output is going to say, oh, page ID is going to be frame 6, frame 17, frame 14, and etc. That's one thing, okay? That's going to be mapping, one to one. The other thing here, this one is going to have extra piece or additional metadata. Which the first one we call this one the dirty flag, and the second one is the what's called the pen or reference and count with the bit flag or dirty flag. This means it's like a bit, okay, set to one. This means once this page has been modified since we loaded from the desk, which is gonna be we call this one dirty. That means you have to, before you delete this one, make sure that the change must be reflected to the desk. Then after that, you can delete or free the space. That's the dirty. The other one, we call this one the pin or the reference counter. This means you need to count or have to say, keep tracking as a measure the number of threads that access this page. For example, every thread try to access the date or the page here is gonna do what? It's like a counter, yeah? It's gonna say, for example, let's be here. Someone try access this page, okay? You see, thread one. I'm gonna say they have a counter equal one now. It can the counter by one, then you say there is one to access the space. When you left done working with the space, you have to determine this one by one. You say zero, that's mean if it's counter equals zero, that's mean no one acts in the space. Why this is very important here? Because now if we third try acts the space, I is going to increase this one by one. For example, if you have C equal five, that means we do have five, let's say, thirds or process. Access the space or working in the space right now. This means please don't delete it. Don't remove it. If you remove this one or delete it or evict it from the buffer pool, even if you need the space, this is not good candidate. You see that starts helping me. How can you decide whether this page makes sense to delete it or no? You see that? So the dirty page, 
the pending reference in the counter is going to be like uh, data that's going to be stored in the metadata uh, page table, which keep tracking with the page that are counted in the memory, are mapping from the page ID into what's called the uh, frame ID. Okay, good. Now, if I have someone try to just say, um, this is just by the pen, by the way. You have this pen, this means the pen, this one is counted, this means equal one. If you have two pens or three pens, this means you have multiple you, uh, threads x in the space. Okay, so assume that we, a thread or process, whatever, try to x the page, and the page does not exist. I check this one, I need page to say, I just have the same example, page two. I want page two. Page two is not existing. How can I tell? I check, I didn't find it. What you need to do here? First, you need to reserve a place, okay? By the way, how can you implement the page table? I'm gonna uh, implement this one using hash table. In memory, hash table, yeah? With the one that expedite the access, how can you find the page that I'm looking for? And maybe call the page ID to the you know, frame ID, okay? Give me one minute, but I need just to finish this one, then I will stop, okay? So I'm looking for the page table, it's not exist, so you need to make sure that since you have a multiple threads act working at the same time in the same database, I'm gonna say, I'm gonna reserve this place, this slot. What does that mean? Is I found an empty slot in the, let's say, the page table. I'm gonna say, okay, I'm gonna reserve this place, I will be back. I'm gonna fetch page, then I'm gonna use this one in order to point to this page in the main memory. That's the meaning here. It's gonna put latch, okay? So about the latch, I'm gonna talk about this one later. So latching here, when you reserve this place, now we're gonna fetch the space to the main memory, uh, sorry, from the disk to the main memory, in any slot here, in any frame, then you are going to update the pointer here. From the page entry that you reserved, is going to point to the new one, okay? Now you can remove your latch, then done. Now the page is available, and the other system give you the return, the address of the page of the memory, so you can work. Why you need to be reserve a place of space here? Because remember, you are not the only person. Let's assume you are a person without the threads. Okay? Try to try to access the data here. So since you are not the only one to try to access the data, so I need to make sure that you reserve a place. Otherwise, if you don't reserve a slot or let's say uh place in the page table, maybe someone else is gonna take this place. Or for example, you do have more space, empty space here. It's given here. We have only two spaces here. If I don't reserve the space, and when to try to ask bring the page from the disk to the main memory, maybe there's another, you say threads, and gonna fetch another two pages, then they're gonna take this place. So you have to reserve first slot in the page table or place, fetch the page that you're looking for from the disk to the main memory, then after that, update, I mean, the address or the value that's a page in the table. So using this one, we can access and you can get to it, I mean, find the page that I'm looking for. One thing just I need to add, since we talk about the latches and the lock, we need just to distinguish between of them. For the locks that is gonna do what? It's like, it's a higher level, okay? Logical primitive that protects the contents of the database. For example, if you have a table, field, and uh, we have, mainly we're gonna use this one to concurrency control. We're gonna see this one later. If we have a multiple transaction, try to access the same piece of information, the first, since both of them try to update the data, remember to transfer amount money from one uh, account A to account B, so, uh, or let's say both, we have two transactions, try to access or modify, or you say, uh, detect $100 from account, specific account. If both of them try to access the data at the same time, modify the data at the same time, we're gonna lose, I mean, the result of the data, yeah? Depends on the, the final result, gonna be the last one gonna update the data. So we're gonna lock this one. So we're gonna take a lock later more details. So this, just speaking, when transaction gonna uh, lock, let's say, uh, a specific field, triple, whatever of the data there. So it's gonna be as long as the the trans transaction still working on this part. So it's gonna be the lock is gonna be there. Okay, it's gonna be last. And to the transaction, I said, okay, I'm done from this part. I'm gonna release the lock. I'm gonna cover this one later when we talk about the concurrency control. The second part, or the second type of the, what's called, I mean, the uh, uh, distinction between a lock and the latch. The latch is gonna do what? Is the low level protection primitive that the database management system gonna use in order to protect, I mean, the critical section. 
It's like internal data structure. It's not it's not physical. It's not I mean when I say not physical, I mean it's not record, it's not tuple, it's not relations, I'm just it's not index, and just something like internal representation, something gonna be in the main memory. For example, like the hash table. It's gonna be built in uh, fly in the main memory just to try to navigate to show me the way how to access the data, etc. So that internal representation, internal data structure. So we're gonna use what's called I mean latch in this case. Okay, so one thing you need to add here, since I'm talking about the page table, the page directory, whether there is a similarity, similarity or not. Some people may, might be confused at the beginning, but remember, the page table, the one or the data structure that you're going to build that help you in order to map a page ID into what? Into a specific frame, into the buffer pool. The page directory is going to map the page ID in the physical level, not in the memory level, okay? Uh, take the page ID and they tell me where is the page location within the database file. So both of them are different. Of course, when you try to access any table or any file, the first page you need to fetch to the main memory to the world, you have to fetch to the page directory. Because the page, the page directory can tell me exactly where they can, where can find, I mean, the page in the file that can be stored with the desk. Once you fetch this one, you're going to be maybe in one frame, one or two, three. Then you have to build what's called the page table. Which in the main memory is going to facilitate how can we access the pages or locate any page within the frame. So the difference must, I mean, pay attention with the difference between two terminology here. Okay, so far so good, hopefully. So now let's take a look, for example, how, uh, I mean, uh, how the database management system is going to allocate memory to the buffer pool or for the buffer pool in general. There's a two policies, two ways in order to perform that. The first one we call that is the global policies. The second one is the local policy. For the name is maybe it's clear that what we deal with what. So for the global policy here, generally speaking here, we in this case, how the database is going to be allocated the buffer pool, it's going to deal with the decision that the database management system, system should make the benefit the entire that entire workload, okay? that being executed right now. Take a look to the, all the active transactions right now. And you see, for example, okay, I have, for example, 100 active transactions. It looks like these and transaction is working, let's say, or mainly access page one, page two, page three. So it's better to keep page one, page two, page three in the memory, don't touch them. So based on whatever I have in the live transaction, I try to find the best decision or the best policy you can enforce in the system in order to make sure that everyone is going to be have good benefit of this one. So treat all the transactions equally, see for example where the access to what, in order to decide which page they need to get to it oh, later. The other way to perform that, what is called the local policy. I'm not treating all the transactions equally, no. Let's say, I'm not going to say my friend, but assume that you have a set of transactions has a higher priority, or take a look to the transaction level and see, do the best that can help or make sure this transaction queries request is gonna be running faster than the others. So it's so this time when you try, mainly by the way, when you have like, page is gonna be stored in the, uh, let's say, in the frame, at the buffer board, as a frames. Now I need to example to get rid of some pages. So what I'm looking for, take a look to the specific transaction or the, the transactions that are running right now or the transactions that high priority and say, sir, what's the best that I can do for this transaction makes his life easier, running faster. So in this case, if I still this transaction page one and page two, X by this transaction, transaction, this means I'm gonna keep them in the memory and get rid of the rest of the page. If I need space, try to choose another page that maybe has X or more frequently acts by the other transactions. So to summarize, the global policy is, is about what? How the database management system should make decisions for all the active transactions. The local policy, no. Allocate frames to specific transactions without considering the behavior of the concurrent transactions. I don't care about the others, only get, get the benefit of one or specific transactions, okay? And generally speaking, the system must system gonna do the mix, both of them, okay? That's how to you perform or try to come up with the uh, enforce the policy in the buffer board. More is going to be more details when you talk about the replacement policy and etc. Okay. So that's all about the buffer board. 
we have how it looks like, how it works, how can data they'll be fetched in the specific frame. We need to build in the top at the, uh, say what's called the page table, in order to help me in order to maybe whatever the page ID to specific frame, where it's gonna be located, okay? Now we take a look here, uh, different ways that we can optimize the buffer pool, okay? And in order to make sure that the buffer pool work better depends on the application workload that we have here. And remember, we talk about the operating system and the database management system. And we keep in saying that the database management system is doing a better job than the operating system. Why? Because the database management system knows what's going on with this data. How the data looks like. What the, can decipher the data because the database management system is the component of the unit that make this, that create this data and know exactly how can you decipher them, how can you tell, for example, whether perform, for example, prefetching pages, can know, for example, how the query is gonna work looks like, and can predict, for example, what the next page this query is gonna be fetched, and etc. That cannot be done by the operating system because the operating system doesn't know anything about the content of the data. The only thing that you know that this is a sequence of bytes and maybe there's sometimes it's gonna show you some scenario that maybe can predict, but not in all the case, okay? In other words, you're gonna see right now, especially right now, starting with this slide, why the database management system do a better job than the operating system. So one optimization, one set of optimization, we're gonna go over them. We're gonna take a look through multiple buffer pool in general. Then after that, talk about prefetching, scan sharing, then the buffer pool bypass. Let's go one at a time, then after that to see what exactly I'm talking about, okay? The first one is the multiple buffer pool here. So just speaking, when the buffer pool is large, okay? Just be many data requests can be satisfied by retrieving from the memory, okay? But you might encounter what is called the bottleneck, because if you have only one, this, Right now, we assume that we have only one buffer pool, one place that contains, for example, 1,000, 1, 1 million or whatever frames, okay? It depends on the size that uh, memory location that, or the, the amount of memory that you want to allocate to the this uh, buffer pool in this data database. So yeah, I can access them, but the problem is they have a button neck because we have multiple transactions trying to access this buffer pool. Yeah, try to achieve the data, or they say multiple threads, try to access the buffer pool at once or simultaneous, okay? So we can do a better job. Instead, we have only one buffer pool. By the way, it doesn't mean that database management system must have buffer pool. We don't have one, we have multiple, many. We can have multiple buffer pools, which is great. If we have, in, we can enable multiple buffer pools in order to minimize this contention. So this means instead every transaction, or to say every thread, try to ask only the same uh, map table, try to figure out whether the page exists or not. Instead you have one buffer pool, maybe you're gonna have one buffer pool, one, two, three. Oh, great. So now you can redistribute the job of the page among three pages, or to say three buffer pools. So now hopefully we can come up with a better way, or to say uh, we can do a better job, yeah, in this case. When I say better job, that means we can reduce the latch contention, yeah? And uh, maybe we can have a, a let's say, a minimize, or reduce or minimize the latch contention in most case, and we can, I mean, uh, enforce, or let's say, achieve what's called concurrency access in the data. I'm gonna show you that, what do you mean exactly here with simple example here? So we have many ways to do that. Either we're gonna, as I mentioned, multiple buffer board instance, so for the same here, instead we have one, we're gonna one, two, three. So we're gonna show you later, how can you assign the pages? For example, we have page one, gonna be page one, page two, page three, it's gonna be buffer pool one, and page four, five, six, all is gonna be buffer pool two, and etc. So when you try to ask the data, it's easy to get back and forth, and easy gonna be refetching the data and processing the data, and also reduce the amount of the data gonna be, uh, or the polluted buffer pool. We're gonna cover this one later. Okay? So again, the database can maintain, in this case, multiple buffer pool for different purposes. What different purposes? The first one is simple thing, multiple instance, okay? So each page is gonna be stored or in, or to say read from the buffer pool, and it's assigned to one of the buffer pool randomly. Of course, when you say randomly, it's not actually, it's gonna be every time the page one, if it's 
located a core or assigned or stored in the buffer pool one. So it's going to be always going to be assigned to buffer pool one. I'm going to talk about next slide that different way. How can you perform the job? Okay. How can you assign the page from the desk to a specific buffer pool? Okay. So this one depends on the answer. The other thing, maybe the other thing, say, okay, maybe have since we have three databases, database one going to be the buffer pool one, and another buffer pool for the database two. We have two, three different databases working the same database. I mean, in the database management system. So for each database, I'm going to assign or locate a single buffer pool. That's the one way. Or the other way to do that, you can bare page, bare buffer pool. Type buffer pool, sorry. Bare page, that means maybe they have index, going to be in one buffer pool. Yeah? And log entries is going to be for another buffer pool. So you have a different scenario, different way. How can we come up? And the, all of them, you have, instead you have one buffer pool, you're going to have a multiple. The content is going to be different, either going to be database, based on database, or based on the data type that, for the page type that you're going to store here, okay? This one again is going to divide the buffer pool, it's going to work. And to separate instance, for example, can improve the concurrency, okay? By reducing the contention as a different thread, it's going to be able to write to cache page. We're not in the one in the multiple. That's great. So. How can you said since you said assume we have two buffer pool, buffer pool one and two, okay? So how can you assign them here? By the way, this is in most of the database here, they have this. Okay? So how can you assign, since we have a multiple buffer pool, how can you take one page from the disk and say this one is gonna be either this buffer pool or that buffer pool? And I'm keeping saying, emphasize that once that page, or specific page one, is gonna be uh, stored. Or read or put it in the buffer pool one. That means every time you fetch this one, get be go to the same buffer pool. Not every time get be different. No, it's gonna have a fixed. So it looks like a fixed structure, which allow us to perform that. Uh, I think I'm speaking fast because it's getting excited. So please, if you have to speak fast, just say please slow down, take it easy, relax. Okay. I try to keep remind myself. So the first one. Or two approach to do that, I can use what it's called, I mean, uh, object ID and the second one using hashing. And again, we try to find the ways in order to mapping whatever the desired page that fetch in the buffer board from the desk to a specific buffer board. Okay? So what's the object ID? The object ID looks like something like this, okay? It depends some database they have this one, not every one. Okay? For the bus guess, we don't have this one. For the Oracle, we do have. If you remember that we talked about the record ID, I just show you that for record ID for the Postgres, we do have like the page ID and the slot number. For the Oracle, the size of the record ID is going to be larger because it's going to have what's called the object ID. So this is the record ID 1, 2, 3. From inside, you're going to have like the page ID, the slot number. Then here you have something called the object ID. So the object ID just tell me, for example, uh, give which, let's say, uh, puffer. Pool, I'm gonna store this record. Either gonna be one or two or three. This looks like a point that is a specific part. Okay? Not every single database management system achieves this one or can do that. So clear, one, two, three, you will expand this one, you're gonna say page ID and the slot number and object one or two or three. So every time this record will try to fetch or try from the main memory, from the desk, and gonna be always assigned, for example, the buffer for the store based on the value of the project ID. So it's gonna be fixed. Once you reorganize the data, etc., maybe this one can be changed. But now since data can be fair, I'm fetching the data back and forth, so every single record based is gonna be stored based on the object ID. The second one using hashing. The hashing is the simple thing here. For the hashing, you can you know how to compute the hash. Hash that we hash whatever the value that we have, and this one it looks like mapping the entry that we have or the hash value we need to compute into a number of packs, zero up to n, etc. The simple way to do that take, for example, let's say hash x module two or three. So this one all regardless of the value of x, the result is going to be either zero, one, or two. So it looks like we have three buckets. So you assume that we have a three buffer pool in this case. Yeah? So based on the hash, the value of the ID or the record ID, take this one, module three, either it's going to be zero, either one or two. So always, based on the value of the record ID, it's going to be assigned to the specific or the same, uh, you say, uh, buffer pool. 
Clear, guys? So we have two different ways to perform that. Question. That's what you call a bin multiple puffer pool. Again, the good thing, the basic system don't do that. The database management system can come up with a multiple puffer pool, not one. Okay? In order to speed up the access to the data, in order to improve the concurrency, and also in order to minimize the contention. Because you have multiple threads to try to access the same one single puffer pool, now they're going to try to access multiple puffer pool. And we have a different types based on instance, with the data, or the data, uh, the database, or I'm speaking fast again, and based on the data type, whether that be index or the page. Let's say uh, total data or log entries and etc. Okay. So the second optimization we can perform that the database management system can do better job than the operating system is called the prefetching. Okay. So remember every time remember the goal here to give illusion to the user that all your data are available in the main memory. Of course, we cannot do this one, but we try to come up with the tricks, data structure, techniques in order to achieve this goal. So multiple buffer pools, the one way. The second one, prefetching, which allow me in order to fetch the data and or predict what they try to access to. Okay, what kind of data? I mean, it looks like I know that you have page one, page two, page three. Definitely, you're gonna access page four, page five. So I'm gonna fetch to you without asking that. I anticipate, I predict. We're going to see how it works. So, so assume that you have, I'm going to give you two examples, okay? One example, you're going to see that the operating system can do the same job as the database, but not always, because it depends on the type of the query. So, we're going to do, I mean, Two queries, okay, or two access the data. We are going to cover this one later more details when we talk about the query optimizations. Every time you ask the data in the disk, assume student relation that contains student ID, name, and etc. In order to ask this relation in the lower level, you have to retrieve the data, and you have a different ways. Either you're going to perform what what is called sequential scan. This means I'm going to scan all the blocks that contains this data. For example, this uh, student relation can be break it down because it's a file. It's going to be stored in the desk. Assume that it's going to be have six pages. Page one, two, three, four, five. Something like this. Okay? So in the sequential scan, it's scan page one. Then after that, two, three, four, five. All the pages that have the content of this two relation that I want to achieve. Index scan is different. You don't need to scan the entire blocks. No. You have to consult index, and index is going to say, okay, you're looking for a specific value? You're going to say, yes. You're going to say, okay, retrieve. you need only block one and block two. Done. Or block six. Just, you don't need to perform the sequential scan. Each of them is going to have advantage and disadvantage. We're going to cover this one later more details. But right now, just to have see the example, how the database management system uh, do what is called the prefetching. It depends on the workload or it depends on the query plan they try to achieve or try to execute. So take a look at the sequential scan here. Assume that you have a query, and this query is going to scan the entire relations. Okay, so start from this is the disk pages that five pages, uh, six pages that all the pages that belongs whatever relation that you wanted to scan sequentially, all of them, all the content. The buffer ball, for example, that's an example, allow me to fetch or store three pages. So you have only three slots or three frames. Good. That it's empty at the beginning, so I query try to execute. Start in the beginning. I said, okay, the page does not exist. I'm gonna start this page and fetch the buffer ball. Then after that, starting processing this page. Once done, the query now said, okay, now I need to do what? I know the query is that select. Assume that select star from R, and this is R. So you have to fetch all the blocks. Now take once you're done processing this one, jump to the next block and fetch this one to the memo to the buffer pool. You do have space? Yes. When you fetch this one, you're gonna perform the same process. Uh, go to that uh, let's say the base table, uh, put the latch, reserve a slot in the base table, fetch the base that you're looking for, update it to the buffer pool, then after that update the content or the entry at the uh, slot at the base table in order to point to this page into the buffer pool. Then return the ID or the base ID to the query, then perform the processing. I'm gonna 
skip this one because we know what's gonna happen here. Okay, so we start next the next page. Fetch it. You have a space. Start processing here. Okay, why the system is processing here? The system gonna say, okay, looks like the database because know the plan that you're gonna perform sequential scan. So that means you're gonna achieve all the blocks of this data. So I know that this guy expect that the next page is gonna be two and three. It's going to fetch them. So let's do this one. Why this guy processing the page one right now? The query when I say guy. So now I need to I need to fetch page two and page three, two pages, because I cannot touch page one because the currently Q1 is working on this page, but I can't what? Get rid of page zero, and we have two space to fetch page two and page three here in advance before he asked, he didn't ask me yet. So the query once finished processing this one, you're gonna see what? You're gonna see, oh, I do have like this page is gonna be available in the main memory. Yeah? So now when the query one try to access this page, you're gonna find page two is there. Page three is there, and the system at the same time starting to do it what? Since the user finish processing one page, that's sort of the buffer pool, you try to jump to the next one, and do what? I'm gonna prefetch the next two pages, the prefetch two pages, okay? So the system is gonna perform like a scan build like that. Someone made a debate say, okay, I guess the operating system can do that. I agree with you. It might the operating work in this case, because their data maybe is, in the sequential order, and they can access, since I'm accessing all the data, the operating system can do that too. But, if I have a different query here. So I mean, we can continue finish this one, yeah? Until you reach to the end. Assume that we have the square, and this is, I've said, I want to retrieve the data from relation A, and based on the value that between 100 and 250. Remember we said they have, we can store different data types in the page. One of them either is going to be the tuple or the content, and the other one or that data type you can store with the index. So index here, I'm going to store the page which that contains the data that belongs to the index. Generally speaking, or the simple thing here, the index is just going to have two, two bars or two fields, the key and the pointer. Okay? So the key, it depends on the, what's the search key that you use in order to create this index. Maybe it's gonna be based on the student ID. In this case, maybe we're gonna build the index based on the value, wow. okay? And here the pointer, it depends on the type of the index. Is it gonna be the base ID or is it gonna be the record ID? Where I can't find the record, I mean the entry for the record that contains this information. Of course, this pointer is gonna to point to what? It's gonna to point to another page that contains, I mean, the tuples or the data from the relation A in this case. So it's gonna hear, for example, what the contents of A, maybe gonna have uh, four entry pair, or four attributes, sorry, per uh, tuple, okay? So in order to store this data, I'm gonna store the index in one page or set of pages, and the contents of the, whatever relational data that we have is gonna be stored in another page, okay? This is an example how the index looks like, okay? So here, remember, here's gonna be Key pointer, key pointer, key pointer, key pointer are going to be stored in this index. And the structure of the page is similar to the structure of the page that you showed to you before when you store the data inside. Of course, we have a header, we have a slot array, and we have a tuple. It's going to be stored in the reverse from the end to the beginning, and the slot array is going to be increased from the beginning to the end. Yeah? And this is the way how can you fill that. But instead we have a tuple, I'm going to store the index entry. Clear? So assume that we have an index. In order to access the data using index scan, you have relation A. In order to perform this one, I'm gonna say scan, based in, let's say value. So it looks like you have a specific operator, if you know the relation algebra operator that you use in order to express the plan that we have. And here, I'm not gonna perform sequential scan. This means, please don't go jump to the relation, uh, I mean, fetch every single block that belongs to the relation A. No, jump, not this one. Go to the index first. Page in the index is going to tell you which page you're going to perform. Okay? And in this case, assume that we have a tree index, whatever. Okay? So the tree index you're going to build, you're going to, all the data is going to be stored here in this index. Okay? If you do want to see how the tree index looks like, this is a structure. We're going to see that later when you talk about the P plus tree, how can you create index? I think next lecture, after we finish this part, we're going to start looking at the indexing techniques. So we're gonna cover this one in more details. Generally speaking, we have like 
you organize the data and the index uh, and tree structure. You start from the root, and here you base. Remember, we build this index based on the value. Okay, the value here, and assume that we store the data in the ascending order. So you start at the top, and the root either navigate your way to the left or the right. Left subtree that means the value that, for example, less than the 200, and the right subtree if the value is greater than or equal to 200. Of course, we have some entries here. We're going to see that. It's going to help me in order to decide my way, which the position go to the left or the right. Okay? And in this point, you can tell whether you go to the low level. So we call this one null leave, and this is the leave node which contains, I mean, pointed to the actual record of the data that's stored. Okay? Or the content. Or maybe it's going to be record ID in the lower level. Anyway. In order to access this one, what we need to do here? First, you have to fetch this one. In order to use the index, the index must be available or resides in the main memory. So take the index. First page, I need page zero. Remember my query yeah? that I try to achieve here. I need to select start from A with the value between 100 and 250. Okay? So you start with the top here. This is your query. Okay? Build the index zero first. Then after that, you, once you fetch the index or the root here, you can't tell, for example, which page you're going to perform. It's going to tell you, oh, that means go to the page 1 or page 2. Here it's going to tell me the page in the level. When it's your structure, this one is going to say go to the page 1 or go to the page index page 4. Okay? So once you tell me here, I'm looking for the value between 100 up to 200, yeah? So here, what's called range query. We go down and to go to the low level. Then after that, we're going to scan, I mean, jump to the next node, leave node in order to retrieve the data. That's the way to scan. It's similar to the tree structure that you study in the data structure. OK? So start here. In the page, you tell me here, based, when you fetch the index page 1, I can extract the information inside this one. I'm looking for the value is greater than or equal 100 and less than or equal 200. Is it greater than or equal 100? That means you're going to say, OK, you have to fetch index page 3, not 2. So the system is going to jump and say, OK, I'm going to, after that, I'm going to jump fetch page 3. Yeah? And after that, the system, once you reach a page of three, you can jump, you have a pointer, we're going to see the tree structure, how it looks like. You didn't need to go up and down the tree using the people plus three. If you try to answer a range query, go to the lower level value that you're looking for. Once you reach the leave node, you didn't need to go up back to the higher level or to the root or no, or no leave node, just try to jump to the sibling node in order to achieve the rest of the formation, which is going to say, here you're going to tell you the value 102, jump to the next, and here you're going to find out the value that you're looking for. Only you need to fetch this index. That's what I mean the database, uh, on how can you answer this query? Let me go back here one step here, because we're talking about the prefetching here. Once you have the index zero, then after that you're going to fetch index one here, okay? So the system or the value, because the database management system knows the content, can't intercept, can't decipher. And you're going to say, OK, after page 1, this guy is going to have X page 3 and page 5. OK? For the operating system, you're going to just do what? Page 0, page 1. Oh, it looks like this one didn't do sequential scan. So I'm going to have page 2 and page 3. Fetch in advance. Why this guy passed page 1? Because it doesn't know anything about the content here. But the database management system is not going to do this mistake. That's why I said the database management system is going to do a better job, because we know what's going on, what you try to achieve. Clear? I'm going to say clear to myself. OK. That's one thing. That's the prefetching. The second one, we take a look, what's called the scan sharing here. What do you mean here? Remember, another optimization can be done by the buffer pool in order to make sure that reduce the stall, or to say, every time you try to find the page not exist in main memory, you have to fetch the disk. I'm going to find out the better way, tricks, database, structure, whatever. Something help me in order to give whatever the user looking for and give them the illusion that whatever you're looking for is available in the main memory, not in the disk. So the disk sharing here. So just speaking here, it looks like this is one query working, okay? Fetching data. And we have another query is going to fetch, for example, the same amount of data, okay? So instead of this query starting from the beginning, start to fetch the block from the top, maybe you're going to say, since there is a query is already running, and this query is going to ask the same set of 
block that I'm gonna ask them. So let's, uh, but these uh, queries running uh, ask the same amount of data. So in the other words, the second query is not gonna fetch new any tuple or new blocks. Just try to ask whatever the first query asks to. Once the first query is done, asking all the data, now the second query is gonna say, okay, I asked only a bunch of the data, but I didn't ask the, the say, a set amount of blocks. So let's do this one. I will ask the, the set of blocks that I missed. That's what you call the uh, sharing or scan scare, uh, sharing. So in other words, the query cursor can attach to other cursor, okay? And scan the same page together. We'll say cursor, this means the way that the database management system is gonna keep tracking which page every uh, query access and which acts what and which one didn't ask to. So we can later catch up and ask the one that it didn't ask to. Keep track of, uh, for example, the number of the page that acts by specific or any query in general. So again, in this case, the query cursor can reuse the data retrieved by, or let's say from the storage or the operator com computations. So in other words, this technique is going to allow that we have a multiple queries to attach to the single cursor that scans the tables. Okay, so if a query starts scan at the beginning, let's give you an example here. Let's go here first. You have one query, Q1, X the entire data from page zero up to page five. Select or perform the sum value from A and assume the relation A has only six pages. So in this case, query one, fetch page one is not there. The same technique, maybe you do prefetching, whatever. Assume that everything works fine. Page zero, page one, and page two, okay? Then after that, now the query here reached the base three, okay, and there is no space. Yeah, so and if there is no space, what we need to do here, the query is gonna try or the database management system or the buffer board is gonna have like a replacement policy. Now I need a space. I need to make sure which page I need to remove from the buffer board in order to free space to the new to or page that we need to fetch the from the desk and then be stored there. So here it depends on the placement policy. We're gonna cover some of them in this part, in this class. So maybe least recently used. The one that used for didn't use for a long time, is gonna be the one that's gonna be deleted. So remember, you start page zero, then after that X page one, then after that X page two. So what's the least one that you used, or one that used for a long time, which P0, now we delete P0. You move this one, and of course, add this one, the engine is dirty, and the pin or the counter reference count is zero, now I can delete it, okay? If the dirty pet is set to one, that means you need to reflect the change during this course, okay? Before you remove or free the space. Then after that, you're gonna fetch this one B3, it's gonna be in this place for the B0. So that's what you have, okay? Now, we have another query. And this query in U2 is gonna do what? It's gonna perform whatever any operation, either it's going to be the same or not, the most important thing for us is going to ask the same amount of data that acts by the query one. In other words, here in this case, with our example, it's going to scan the entire data. Yeah. So what we're going to do here? We have two options. The first option right now, this query two starts from the top. I need to fetch page zero. Okay. Page zero is not exist in the main moment because I just get rid of it. So what I'm going to do, I just show you the simple solution, okay? So in this case, I'm going to say, okay, uh, remember we have page zero, page one, page two. Now we delete page zero, I add page three. So for this query, I need to have a different color. I am, it's going to do what here? I'm going to get rid of one page. I own page one, page one, and replace with the page zero, okay? That's the goal that you perform here. But you see that if you keep doing that, so the next thing you need to perform here for the query one, uh, two, sorry, is gonna fetch page one. Because we just remove it, delete, that the one you need to just remove it. Now we need to delete page two in order to add page one, and etc. This is not good solution. So let's have a better solution. You see that this is the normal way how to perform without any optimization, without achieving or using what is called the, uh, the scan. Okay. I thought someone was asking. Okay, so this is not good, okay? So what I'm gonna do in this case, instead to do that, I'm gonna have a better idea. Q2 is gonna start, but I know the system notice that, oh, this one's gonna perform average with aggregate function, 
which is going to be formed over all the counters at the serialization A. So how about, don't fetch uh, both of you and try each of them going to work alone. Let's do this one. A jump with a Q1. Whatever the Q1 X is right now, I just start, it looks like start square two X, the data from page three. Can you do this one? Yes. In the relational data model, they said the data can be stored in any order. And especially this one, in the average, either starts with page three or four or five or two or one. Uh, as long as you scan the entire data, you're gonna get the same result, regardless from where you start, which page, yeah? So in this case, Q2 is going to say, okay, let's along, go along with the Q1 and try to, whatever bridge Q1 access, I'm going to fetch the data from the disk. Then, keep in your mind, I said, I start from page 3. Then along Q1 and Q2, it's going to work together before uh, whatever Q1 fetch, of the course that use the Q1 fetch, the Q2 is going to access the data from the buffer board. Once the Q1 is done, now the Q2 is going to say, okay, I know that's something here that I start from the page 3, that means and read page 4 and page 5, still I need to ask page 0, page 1, page 2, so it's going to read the rest of the pages. Okay? There's another optimization here. When the query starts running, before it starts running, you're going to say, okay, what do you have in the buffer board? I have page 1, page 2, page 3. Processing them right now. Access them, processing them. Then after that, it looks like you read page 1, page 2, page 3. Then get along with the Q1, continue reading page 4, page 5. Okay, once you're done, now you need only X page 2. So we have many optimizations. But the most important thing here looks like we're gonna do what? Allow uh, the scan sharing is going to allow that multiple cores to attach to the single cursor that scanned the table. Okay, so in other words, if any core starts to scan, and there's an, already another one doing the same scan or ask the data, then in this case, the database management system will attach the second query course to the first. Then, keeping your mind tracking that what uh, uh, tuple that access to, and uh, sorry, it blocks the access or pages, and which one that you don't access in order to catch up and access them later. So let's go up here. You have one query, okay? This query access the whole of data, or the pages that belongs to the relation A. Good. So the way to access one start since the buffer will fall, fetch the data, the buffer board processing, then fetch the next page, processing, fetch the third page, processing. Once you're done, you had now you need to fetch page three. There is no space. It depends on the placement policy. You can decide which one you're gonna delete. So remember in our case we have B0, then after that you fetch page one and page two. The simple policy that you can use in order to get to free space in the buffer board, the least recent to use. The one that you used for a long time. Get rid of this one. So now in order to add page three, I need to get to, uh, right to the page zero. I add this one page three here. So it looks like this now, the next victim is gonna be P1 and etc. Okay? So far so good, yeah? Assume that you fetch page zero, page one, page two. Now you're gonna fetch page three. You fetch page three to the pin memory, okay? Now starting processing here. And assume there's another query is going to access the whole relation A. Either perform the same function. If you perform the same function, then you can uh, you can get the same result, yeah? Let's do different, uh, this, it's not identical query. So this one try to compute, for example, count or compute the average, okay? So generally speaking, if we don't have any kind of optimization, what are we going to perform here? You have you used to have page 1, page 2, page 3. This have different color, uh, the same color in order to be in the same side. I mean, that's a second. Okay. So query 1, page 1, 0. Then after that, fetch page 1. Then after that, fetch page 2. Then after that, in order to fetch page 3, he deletes page 1, 0. Clear? Now we have another query now. In order this query is going to be executed, since you ask the same data, assume that we don't have scan sharing. So what we're gonna do, this, I mean, trivia solution, or strong max solution, or the solution is bad, it's gonna do what? I need to fetch what? Page zero. I just missed this page zero because we just deleted. But in this case, since the page zero is not exact, I need to do what? I need to fetch it. That's me before I fetch it, I need to delete page one, with the least, least recently used one, okay? with the one used for a long time. Don't ask this one for a long time. Then after that, 
when you try to ask page one here, you, you see, you just deleted page one, but since you don't have space, now you delete page two in order to ask page one. In order to ask page two as the query two, you need to delete page three, then ask page two. Then now you need to ask page two, three, and four, etc. So using this solution, you just remove the page that you needed later in the near future. That's a waste of time. This can, but our conversion is going to be too much. We have a better solution. It's called scan sharing. And instead of doing this one, we have a better way. What do you have here? We already have one query is, is working X in the data. So instead, you, the query two is going to start fetching the page zero, one, two, it's going to do what? Let's attach myself to the query one. Whatever the query one fetch the main memory, the base, I mean, I'm going to process the base that I found in the main memory that fetched by the key one. Okay? But keep in your mind that you have like extra piece of information, metadata set, you start fetching the data from the base three. Okay? And this query again, Q2, regardless from where you start with the base from, from base zero or from base one or two or three, as long as you scan the entire data, that or the star relation, you're gonna produce the same result, all right? All right, I'm talking to myself, okay? So, in this case, I start with Q1, whatever Q1 they have, that's what happened here. We get along, it's like connected together, attached to whatever I have, whatever data got here, so we have only one cursor, in other words, Two cores try to access the data. If the data does not exist in the main memory, only perform one fetch disk and put out, put this one in the main memory. So everyone, by the way, any, any query can see the data available in the buffer pool. So I have fetched this one, the base that needed by two cores or three cores or four cores, only once at the time. Perform this one, once it's done, the query one is done. Query two, you're gonna say, okay, I messed in, I start from the page three, but still I need to fetch page zero, page one, page two, with the one that they're gonna perform here. Okay? That available in, let me go back here, that's available on many or multiple database management system here. It's supported by the data, IBM database two, uh, Microsoft SQL Server, and the Postgres two. But if you take a look here to this link, it's gonna give you more details about if you enable synchronize uh, sequence scan, it's what this one will be uh, on. This means it's allow you in order to attach, you see, two queries or together, or maybe attach what's called concurrent. I mean, scan read the same block at the, let's say, at the, that's gonna be conducted by multiple queries. It's gonna perform, in other words, the scan sharing, okay? Oracle, they have different uh, operation. It's gonna be performed the same one, uh, but it's called cursor sharing. And here they have like, uh, let's say, uh, condition. This query must be identical. Okay, we're gonna perform the same task, the same operation. That's only for the uh, Oracle. Hopefully this makes sense to you guys. So again, the operating system cannot do that the database can do, because we know exactly what's going on in this case. So now, right now, I guess we are convinced that operating system is bad, database is great in this case. I mean, regarding the way how to handle the data. Okay. The other thing here uh, is called the buffer boot bypass. Okay. Remember, every time you perform sequential scan, this one is gonna pollute whatever is, I mean, the buffer pool. Let's do this one here. If you have data here, every time you fetch pages, sequential scan, this means you're gonna start from page zero, one, two, three, four, five. Yeah, so you have only three spaces here. So at the end here, maybe we're gonna scan the entire relations, but you're gonna pollute the buffer bowl. What does that mean, pollution? This means you're gonna maybe get rid of the page that needed by other query, or you are gonna fetch the page that only acts once time, then after that, it's gonna be useless. I don't need them anymore. But pollution that pollutes the buffer pool because we didn't have enough space in the buffer pool. So I can only store only three pages here. Since you're gonna perform a scan, a sequential scan, X 100 pages or all the pages that belongs to this relation, and maybe this relation or uh, these pages only acts by only one query, one time, then after that, every single page that you ask, I don't need them. 
Okay? So, in order to avoid this, okay? So what we're going to do here, I'm going to do what's called the buffer bool bypass. Sometimes, since we have one query, it's going to fetch the, the, access, the entire data or the sequential access the data. Maybe you're going to say, okay, I'm going to reserve specific or locate memory location for, let's say, as a private memory to this query. It's going to be stored not in the buffer bool. It's going to be stored at your, let's say, local, uh, let's say, memory. For example, we have someone or query to write access the data. Query one. So the query one, I assign like a locate let's say, memory amount. It's going to be as a private. Sorry. I'm okay in case you ask. Okay. But again, instead, we're going to every time you ask the data, put the latch at a specific location at the base table, fetch the page from the desk, put it in the buffer board, update this latch, then after that, uh, return the address to the query that ask for this one and you're gonna perform this one for the whole page then you're gonna store here uh, allocate for this uh, relation maybe I'm gonna bypass this one I'm gonna have since this query got to perform the sequential scan I'm not gonna store the page that fetch in the buffer board I'm gonna allocate memory specific amount to the say uh, memory locations that's gonna be only used as a private memory for this query so when the query try to perform, they say page scan, the sequential scan, all the pages gonna be stored here. Instead of doing that. Why I'm gonna do that? Because here I'm gonna use this one only one time. Once I don't need to pollute or modify or get rid of some pages that use or try to make like uh, uh, too many acts or to say uh, I'm looking for the word in English. Overcrowded. Yeah with multiple transactions required to try to compete in order to find, figure out which page is going to get read. Since the question scan, access one one time, put this one in my own memory. Scan all the data, then after that, after done, delete the whole thing. By doing so, I don't need to go through all of the steps that every time the fetch page on the disk is not available in the main memory, put the latch, reserve the latch at the uh, base table or the hash table that we have, then after that, fetch the page, put it in a specific frame, update the entry at the hash table, at the page table, then return the address to the query in order to tell the this is the page that you're looking for. Then you have to perform this one over, over every single page that you need to fetch. That's what you call the buffer board bypass here. So you bypass the buffer board, whatever the fetch data, I'm gonna put this one into like a private memory associated with spell to say uh, uh, the uh, query that you're gonna perform this one okay that's the meaning here this one can be also used for the temporary data if you try to sort the data for that to specific relation for a specific query you need to do this one in the buffer pool do this one in the private memory fetch everything because you're gonna access perform sorting then after that delete whatever uh, let's say uh, acts from this relation if you need this one, if that one used by other queries, etc., or in this case, it makes sense that you're going to perform or ask or put this one in the buffer pool. I mean, we have many optimizations. We try to perform uh, in a way that make uh, the buffer pool or make whatever the user looking for is available in the main memory. And we try to uh, show you that we do a better job than the operating system can can perform. So in other words, in the buffer board for simple words, there is no latch. I'm not going to use the whatever, I mean, uh, the buffer board in this case, bypass the buffer board. Uh, it's called uh, an Oracle, like in SQL, Postgres, etc. All of them, they support this kind of version. Okay? Uh, in the Informix or the IBM Informix, it's going to use, call this one different name. They call this one light skin. If you click over this one, trust me, it's... Uh, it works, it's not malicious, okay? So you can check and get more information about this one, okay? Generally speaking, the definition of light scan in Alphamex, they call that is the sequence, uh, which if in case you have a sequential scan of the large da uh, data tables, okay? That can be, uh, in this case, you have to read this one and you have to bypass, I mean, uh, the buffer ball and get rid of the overhead of the buffer ball in this case. The light scans, are the fastest means for performing sequential scan of large data tables. I like this one. This is a much as a better explanation in this case. You see that? Fastest scan for the sequential scan 
for the entire blocks that belongs to the large amount of the relation that contains a large amount of data. Why? Because if you put this one in the buffer pool, I'm going to pollute the buffer pool. And also, the buffer pool is not easy for It's easy, of course, it's a simple crossing, but you're going to perform this one for every single block if the block is not available in the main memory. So we can bypass this one and put this one in the private memory and done. Okay? Uh, one thing here, we got to check out what is called the Object System Based Cache. Now let's take a look here. I know, you remember I said, we do have two different pages, yeah? One of them, Object System Based, the other one, the Hardware Based, then after that, talk about the Database Based, yeah? In the top here, it looks like the Database Management System is going to take care of everything, but we still rely on the Operating System, okay? In the lower level, when the database said, I need page, for example, two. We try to fetch the page. It's not existing in the buffer pool. What are you going to do here? You have to fetch this one from the disk. How? I know, but we know how to perform that. Yeah. So in this case, when it decided, it said, I need the page 16, the page that in the cylinder 5, disk 2, the cylinder 5, track whatever, block whatever, give me the space. Oh, this is block. Now, in lower level, there's input out operation going to be disk input out operation going to be handled by the operating system. Okay? So the operating system going to do what here? It's going to fetch the data. Then what, it's going to be the hardware page. Then after that, the operating system page. Then it's going to be in the database page. So the lower level, in the bottom of the database management system, we still rely on the operating system somehow in order to perform the basic input out operation. I, yeah, it's better to say the basic input out operation. We agree this one. But since somehow the operating system is going to be in get involved, so every single page is going to be fetched to the disk, and get the operating system is going to have a copy of this page in its own cache. Okay? You got this one? You have one page, you fetch from the disk. So you have it gonna be in the buffer pool. Then the operating system cache, I'm gonna say I have a copy here for this page. We don't like this one. It depends, okay? Some database management system like Postgres is still alive. They say, okay, we it's fine. I need this one. But the most database management system don't do that. They said, no, thank you, hard disk I want, I mean for the operating system, all I need from you just Help me to fetch this one, do the basic input out operation. Move the head at a specific location, read the data. Once you put this one in the past, thank you very much. I will take care of this one. Okay? So here, so the operating system is going to store somehow in its own uh, cache. Sometimes you call this one the, uh, sorry, you call this one the operating system beige cache. So most of the database management system use what is called the direct input output, or direct. Remember that when you open a file, Okay, in the lower level, so you can and you when you perform what's called the open system call, you have some flags you can set. One flag we call this one O direct. If you set this one into the false or set to or set to on or false boolean, it's gonna be true or false. Okay, if you set to true, that means uh, please either gonna be allowed or to have a copy for every single page gonna be available into the operating system cache, or you're gonna say, no, disable this operate, disable this feature, and don't duplicate the database, I mean, the page, every single page that I'm gonna fetch into the memory and also into the operating system cache. You see that? So this operating system cache, every single page fetch, I'm gonna have a copy in the operating system. You have a choice, you can't tell the your database management system, you're gonna say, either I'm gonna do this one or not. In most cases, we don't do this one for the performance, okay? Uh, for the Postgres, they say it's okay for us because I mean the buffer pool that used by I mean by Postgres is not sophisticated. It's not larger than the other the buffer pool that uh, using the other database management system. The buffer pool of the uh, Postgres still rely on the operating system cache in order to handle perform some competition or also to decide which page is going to be available or not. Okay. Of course, it's not more efficient than the other database management system, but they said it's okay, we are fine with that. So, is it clear? So again, 
Most database management system, they can use what is called the direct input output, which is this case specific flag. We do have the link. If you click over this one, you're going to see this one. How can you do this one in Linux? Open the file, and when you open the file, you can see that you have set some features or some flags. Each of them, I think you need to combine this one with the sync flag in order to achieve the goal that you're looking for. Okay? So anyway, the most database management system uses this direct on in order to bypass the operating system cache. Okay? Why? Because I'm trying to avoid the redundancy of the copy of the pages that's it's gonna be in two locations. Okay? And also, if you rely on the operating system, operating system in order to just if there's gonna be the cache gonna be full, they have its own way in order to find out which uh, page is gonna be evicted in order to free new uh, free space to the new page is gonna be fetched from the desk. For the database management system, you know that right now we know better about the content of the data, so we can have a different or better place of policy in order to decide which page is gonna get read without affect I mean the performance or without for example you move the page maybe it's gonna be more frequently asked by the other queries. Okay. So now we talk about the optimizations. We saw that what the pufferable looks like. Now we need to take a look here. What if the pufferable is full? Yeah. How can we figure out which page I need to get rid of in order to free new space? Or free space in order to have uh, uh, the new page going to be fetched in that place, uh, space or that frame. Okay? So again, or in other words, when the database management system needs in order to free up a frame to make space, room for the new blocks, okay, or new page, it must decide, for example, which page you need to evict, which page in order to get rid of, okay, in the buffer, from the buffer board. That's what's called the replacement policy. The replacement policy is an algorithm, okay, or a technique, a procedure that the database management system is going to implement in order to do it, in order to achieve this goal. Okay, in order to decide based on the content of the data, based on the global policy or the, let's say the local policy, the whatever uh, you say transaction life, or based on the particular transaction, we can tell, for example, what the best way in order decision that you can achieve in order to delete which page or get rid of one page. They need to free space. And you're gonna perform this one many times, all the time. As long as you fetch the data, the buffer bulls have limited space. So in this case, you have to come up with a better, let's say, replacement policy or the better, uh, better algorithms. Generally speaking, when you do this implementation, you do have a goals, yeah? And the goals of this implementation for the replacement policy are as following. First one, correctness. I need to make sure that this the policy or basic policy are improved uh, correctness. What does that mean here? For example, don't get rid of the page that's used by someone else right now. Makes sense. If you have one page, you try, for example, in the frame, and you decide I need to remove page one. Make sure here, for example, this is the C or the reference patch, okay? F set, for example, to two. So it looks like you have to search X this page and say, I build or create an implement replace policy mechanism that say, okay, check page one, delete it without checking this one. No, make sure that you are not gonna delete or write down or affect whatever page used by another account is still using by at least one transaction. Okay? I didn't done, I haven't done yet, I'm still working. The correct. The second one, the accuracy here. Okay, so the one this interesting thing, you remember we have P0, P1, P2, and we said the sequential scan is going to pollute, I mean, the buffer ball, so we need to figure out a better way how to organize the data. Sequential scan, we find the solution, you cannot bypass the buffer ball, uh, but we still have sometimes you need to free up page or space from the buffer ball, and I don't want to get rid of the set of pages that the most uh, frequently access page. Take a look at the example that we talk about the index X scan. So remember the index zero, which is the page that contains the root of the tree that you use in order to build the index. If you delete this one, no, that would make my life miserable. That means I, every time to access the scan, I need to fetch this one again. This is one of the important pages that you need to keep them. Yeah. For example, you delete the base that contains the base directory. 
Don't do it because how can you find out the way? How can you tell where I find the page in the desk uh, if I wanted to retrieve it or fetch it? Something like this. So don't delete the page that more frequently access. Okay, you try to come up with a replacement policy that gets rid of the page that maybe you're not gonna uh, need it in the near future. That's one thing. Okay, the other one is speed. Come up with a implementation a replacement policy that works faster. So in order to come assume that you come up with implementation that's been maybe one, two hours just to try to figure out how can you decide which page you need to delete. No, that means no way. We are not gonna use this one, okay? The other thing for the implementation code that we have, we didn't have a metadata offhand, a lot of metadata. For example, in order to decide, you're gonna see that, I'm gonna show you some replacement policy. You are going to implement one of them, the simple thing first and first out, which in this case do what here? you are going to add some metadata, some extra piece of information in order to help you in order to decide which page you're gonna to get to it. But assume that you end up, you have an all, for every single page, maybe you need to require or replacement policies that you implement, require from you to have another page or metadata must be or can be stored or the size of the metadata is gonna be almost the same as the size of the page that you wanted to decide whether it's gonna get turned off or not. So I mean, try to come up with an implementation that doesn't have metadata overhead, okay? So we're gonna take a look here, and you see that we do have different replacement policy, okay? So I will stop here, and which is gonna be the coding assignment too, we're gonna do the buffer ball, okay? 